Hi, everyone. So usually on a Saturday, we're in a room full of people where we are doing a workshop at the assembly. Unfortunately, due to the situation at hand, we have had to adjust. It isn't prudent to have a, a great number of people because usually we go up to like as many as 50 to 100 people in the same room. And with the situation, it's not ideal. So we are going to transform all our regular sessions over to online sessions. Now, luckily, we have been doing a rudimentary web uh, presence throughout whenever we've been doing workshops. We will ramp that up. We are going to add live chat features, and you'll see that once you're on there. Um, so like I said, I mean, unfortunately, according to the situation, we have to break a habit where we had live-only sessions for uh, the last five years. So it is a bit difficult to get adjusted to us for as well. But we have made sure that uh, that we are now, uh, you know, going to be doing this online in a good way that everyone can follow. The learning is not going to stop. So if you are used to assembly sessions every week, please do make sure that you tune in and you can feel free to interact. We've got a very exciting workshops coming up. The next three workshops all have specialist speakers. We've got today, of course, with Sefiq. But next week, we'll be doing Arduino Day online as well. That will also have a lot of, we'll give you more details. And then we will carry on with the workshops as we do every week on that. OK, so I'm going to introduce Safiq in a bit. But first, I just wanted to give you, like those of you who are not familiar with the assembly, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to just like, give you a, a, a brief thing about that. So just a little bit about the assembly. We're a smart lab. Like I said, we've done over 250 wo free workshops. We've been doing them live. We've been doing them with a bunch of people in the room. This is the, this is the first time we're trying to be doing a li uh, an online-only session. Uh, as I mentioned, there are different hack works. Uh, there's a hack stream, which is related to embedded systems, IoT hardware. Uh, this is obviously not a hack session. Uh, we do assembly code sessions also, which relate to software projects and APIs and frameworks and apps. Uh, this particular workshop would come under our brand new assembly data science stream. We've had, this is actually the third data science workshop that we are doing. And uh, the first two have been, like I said, completely packed events. So we hope that we get the same following online as well. Uh, these are mostly related to advanced topics uh, on AI and ML. So in the past, we've done computer vision. We've done business practicalities of machine learning. And this time, we have another interesting topic on transfer learning. Now, transfer learning is something that is used a lot in commercial machine learning. And it's something that people use depend on to, uh, to get, uh, you know, to get uh, their machine learning models off the ground in a, in a quick time. Especially with, and we are going to focus, like most transfer learning sessions, uh, transfer learning uh, paradigms do, on computer vision and on detecting images and how to do that. So uh, Safiq is, uh, is going to speak to that in much more detail. I don't have that level of knowledge about that, but he will definitely tell you that. At the assembly, our target audience is a wide range. So we get a lot of students from colleges. We get professionals. And of course, since we're in the entrepreneurship hub for Internet City in five, we get a lot of entrepreneurs also who are interested in building new products. So we focus on smart exponential technology. So any this is like the technology of the future, but technology that is easily accessible as well. And we do focus on practical applications. So we want you to build something with us. We don't want you to just take notes passively for a rainy day. Uh, we have a forum where we share all our details on, and uh, it also helps us plan our resources. Uh, we do. We will post this session uh, on, uh, you know, I mean, details of, of this session and the current sessions on our forum. So you can definitely check out that. And you can feel free to ask questions there also. However, today we're going to be using the live chat feature that is to the right of your, if you're watching this on the assembly site, you would see it right there. Uh, from time to time, Shafiq will be interacting with the, with, the, with, the, uh, with the speaker. So if you have any questions related to the content, feel free to ask that. We won't be able to get to everything, but we try to get to as many as possible. And we will like do this in batches in between. So we will switch over that when we take a break from the content. But do follow along. This session will be live as well. I mean, will be kept online as well. So you can always catch up with it later. So please do feel free to uh, take a look at it after the case. Okay, oops, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. So just a quick thing to introduce you. I mean, like I said, this is the first time we are doing a, a, a web-only workshop without a live audience. So uh, when, when we announced this and we had, when we had asked 
uh, for presenters. It was still supposed to be a, a live workshop, so we're very grateful to our presenter for uh, you know, adjusting to this new requirement. Uh, so just a little bit about Shafiq, I'll let him tell you more about that himself. He's a research engineer at Khalifa University. The, where we first met him was when he did a, a workshop, uh, well, he did a presentation that was part of, I think, was it DroidCon? Or? Mm -hmm. It was part of DroidCon, and he was presenting about uh, something, and we saw that he had pretty impressive knowledge about some topics that others don't usually consider. You know, So he's, he's a very gifted, uh, machine learning, uh, you know, professional, and he's of course working on it, so he can definitely give you a lot more insight with that. So, Shafiq, like I said, is a research engineer from Khalifa University, so he has come down here to Dubai from Abu Dhabi. But thank you for that, um, Shafiq. I'm going to just hand it over to him, and then he's going to take over the session. Right? Okay, Shafiq, all yours. Thank you, Nico. Uh yeah, thank you very much uh, for the very long introduction. And um, yeah, my name is Shafiq. I'm um, a research engineer at Khalifa University. So I guess um, let's just move on a slide. Um, yeah, a little bit about me. My background is a uh, master's in computer science where, um, uh, where I did it in Mazdar um, Institute before. Um, now it's part of Khalifa University. Um, before that, I was in the University of Nottingham. So this is my second time presenting at the assembly. Um, my, I guess my profession is in machine learning and AI, so most of the stuff that I'd be working on and talking about is related to AI and machine learning. Um, but for the most part, my daily work involves doing a lot of um, programming for research purposes. So think about um, uh, research papers and uh, um, you know, l l training models, but mainly in like a research setting rather than uh, for a commercial setting. But recently, um, uh, I've, I've had the interest to kind of move on to kind of industrial technologies and having more practical things, um, how, how to bring AI into practical world. And, um, and so, you know, this is kind of like my contribution to bringing AI to the masses. Um, yeah, so I guess I won't talk about myself too much anymore. Uh, you can probably find a bit more about me around the net. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll be posting links to my website and my Twitter and so on later on. So let's get to the topic at hand. Um, but I guess before we start, how, how many people do we have on stream? Just to check that we have. Uh, quite a few, okay, okay, okay. Um, they're not gonna tell me a number so I don't get scared, I guess. <laughs> but okay, let's, uh, let's, let's get started, I guess. Um, so to, to begin this whole talk, um, I wanted to kind of briefly, uh, well, before, before any of that, um, today happens to be a special day. Um, it's a special day to many people who are um, mathematically inclined. Today is March 14th, which is Pi Day 3.14. Um, so, well, I guess it's Pi Day to like the Americans. Us uh, over on the other side of the Atlantic, we we write it as 14 slash three, so it doesn't really make sense. But you know. To any American um, date, you know, uh, f uh, subscribed <laughs> American date subscribed viewers, uh, today's your day. Today's Pi Day for you. Um, uh, it will never be Pi Day for us over on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, okay, enough of that. So, what I wanted to first talk about is my participation in BitGrid's um, dog breed prediction competition. So, BitGrid is like this uh, online. Um, machine learning sort of puzzle thing, but they also do like job uh, sort of thing. Like they they uh, they headhunt people or like match people's uh, profile to uh, candidate uh, to companies and stuff. So uh, Big Grid, they have it's kind of like a Kaggle sort of side. There's many Kaggle duplicates or Kaggle types of site where you you know you have a problem at hand and then you try and solve that using machine learning or AI usually machine learning or AI unless you've got um, um, uh, other techniques but the point is that you there you're given a task and you you try and solve it by uh, d modeling the problem and then you 
you are given a test set, you have to test um, how well your model does um, uh, on, on the training set. Um, so you, you test the, your model on the test set, that's what I meant to say. Um, so in the inaugural competition, the first one they ever had um, was this dog breed prediction competition and it consisted of about 218 breeds, so your class size would be 218 and there's about 83,000 images of dogs. So that's relatively small um, in terms of size uh, compared to the number of um, labels because uh, if you think about ImageNet, it has thousands of, um, uh, thousand, a thousand labels, but it has a million uh, images in the data set, a million plus. So um, my best try, and I can't remember uh, what I exactly got, I think it's around 65%. Um, uh, and the way I did it was through transfer learning, what we're gonna discuss today. But I get about 65%, they kind of hit the leaderboard now, or they never had a, a leaderboard, I can't remember, but I can't access it anymore, so whatever. Um, so I initially wanted to have this data set be used for the, um, for the purposes of this talk, because it kind of explained how, my, um, how, how I thought about trying to solve these sort of problems. Um, but unfortunately with the, um, um, with the competition, there's like an NDA and the, the data set's a little messy. Um, so I, um, I couldn't use it. Well, yeah, so the, the NDA itself was enough to say like, okay, I can't, I can't kind of publicize the data set. But if you join BitGrid's platform, you, you, are, you do have access to these uh, image data, and, but I don't think you can do any submissions because the competition's closed. But anyway, so uh, it all started here. So I wanted to find something that is similar. Um, but before I go on to that, let me just show you uh, what kinds of images that I faced during, um, during that competition. So there are some images that are quite good. Um, so like, you know, typical dog looking images. So uh, there's like a bunch of dogs, a dog on a bed, a dog, you know, in front of a fence and so on and so forth. Um, so, so there are like, there are some really high quality images, some high, um, um, high fidelity images. Um, but at the same time, you had a lot of noise as well, as I mentioned before. This data set is particularly noisy. And you have things like dogs um, like this, where there's like a bigger dog in the background, which could be, fo uh, could be fooling the model. Um, and then there's um, images of dogs with um, text on it. So there's like Dalton and like Barkey's legacy down here. And um, there's like more images of dogs and you know, text. And there's uh, this notorious one, which is a dog and a bunch of dogs around it, which is gonna, uh, yeah, a little, <laughs> a little confusing for, um, for the model, I bet. Um, uh, again, some more noise, and this one, which is um, just a bunch of text and like a tiny picture of a dog, which is probably not even the right label, uh, if I remember correctly. So, um, so you've got a bunch of noisy images like this. Um, and of course, like any good uh, competition data set, there's um, um, the, the, the best type of images, the totally useless ones. Um, so there are you know, pictures of templates, basically insert your picture of a dog here, or there's one with a dog stretching its back saying standards, whatever that means. And one that's like, I don't know what this is, a German Shepherd, a Rottweiler, I don't know. Um, uh, saying, can you help me? And it's all like um, cartoonish. So I guess the neural net can prob probably detect this, but it's a weird looking dog in, uh, at, at the first glance. And of course, um, uh, not just that, we have images like this. No photo, uh, perfect. So, <laughs> and, um, and a totally, you know, uh, breed, breed agnostic dog, if you will. Um, and the worst part of this image is there's about 3,000 of them uh, in the data set. And there's also another even more useless image, which is no image available. So there's not even a dog on that image. And <laughs> um, luckily there's like not as many of those. There's about 74 of those in the data set. But basically it's very noisy. It's, um, it's really messy. I had to do a lot of data cleaning. Um, and we'd probably just spend a lot of the time cleaning the data. If, uh, if we were uh, if we were here, maybe that could be 
something for the next talk or something. Um, data cleaning is, is a journey in, a, in and of itself, and it's probably interesting to kind of explore that. Um, so what I found um, instead was this Caltech UCSD Birds 200 data set. So there's about 200 categories, which is about the same as the number of dog breeds we had, 218 versus 200. But there's a lot fewer images, so there's about 11,788 images. Um, so around about 30 images per class uh, for training. And this is um, particularly interesting um, because we have a, a very, very, very tight data set to work with. So 30 images per class and you have 200 classes, you have an imbalance of like the number of categories versus the number of training data. But that's not the big issue. Um, we're we're going to find out how to train this properly, hopefully. Um, uh, so uh, what I did for the data is I pre-segmented it. Um, there, it comes with like segmentation boxes. Um, and because of the birds data set being like quite varied in terms of like, so there's like big views, like landscapes and things like that. And the bird is not always focused in the image. So luckily someone gave segmentation boxes and I pre-segmented it. Um, if you want to find um, the original data set, there's a link here. We'll post up the slides later on so you can check it out yourself. Okay? So let's have a look at the images um, with segmentation. Um, so that's like one of the images, a bird kind of diving downwards. So someone segmented the box around the bird and uh, we, we kind of want to remove all that. You can use the original images as is. Um, I wanted to see, uh, I wanted to do some data cleaning so we, we can kind of get ahead of ourselves. Um, yeah, there's a puff in here, there's like a bird there, again, more boxes. So there are, there are not all perfect images, there are obscurities and text and stuff, but I think the, bond, the bounding boxes uh, removes a lot of it. And there's different viewpoints as well, one from the top, one from the side, um, different orientations, different colors. So. Um, very good data set, I think, to work with for today. So, um, yeah, let's, um, so I cleaned the data set. It's, uh, I've split it according to the metadata. It's about a half split. Um, uh, it's actually a 50-50 split, but I've taken the validation from the test set, so it's, um, and I didn't take too much. Uh, I think I took about 10% from the test set, but all that's inconsequential. Um, uh, I just wanted something that we can work on very, very easily with. Um, so let's have a look at the data. Um, we can get it from my website because uh, the, the original data sets um, got all the segmentation, uh, hasn't, hasn't done all the segmentation and everything. So since I've done all the segmentation for you guys, I've put up the images on my website. Um, so let's head there and we can start coding. So uh, my website is here, shaffers.xyz. Um, uh, I wonder if the viewers can see this. Uh, maybe, I, uh, do you think we can put a text of my website, maybe just a link? Because I, I forgot, ah, you know what? I'll, I'll put it on the slide. Uh, or is that a good idea? Okay, let's put it on the slide because um, they're gonna need it. Let me just put it right here. So in massive, uh, yep. Uh, let me just close that. Yep, so that's the website, sorry. Uh, HTTPS forward slash forward slash chaffers dot X, Y, Z. So I wonder if you guys can freeze that or uh, if some of you guys managed to get that, then that's cool. If not, um, just follow along with me. So at my website, if we go down to the data set section, there's the segmented Caltech UCSD birds 200 data set. So you copy the images comma zipped. So just copy a link of that. So we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Colab today. Um, so uh, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Colab. Uh, but it's like a free service provided by Google um, where you can have like a Python notebook to work with online. And you have the access to GPUs, so um, for free. And so you can do lots of training and stuff. 
for mainly for hobbyist sort of types of projects rather than really long term training. I think you can do like a you can get like a pro account or something like a uh, like a paid account that you can train for a lot longer. But uh, I think they give you this notebook for about twelve hours at a time. Um, and then they it gets refreshed, but you don't lose any of your uh, any of your notebook uh, content. So if you type code and stuff, it gets saved into your Google Drive, assuming you have a Google account. Um, it gets saved into your Google Drive, and you can return back to it and stuff. So um, really useful, right? So let's um, let's get coding. So I'm gonna start as I do uh, with every talk. We're gonna start with a fresh notebook, so blank slate. I'm not going to assume we know anything at all, so we're going to face all the troubles along the way. Uh, of course, I do have a backup plan uh, if things go really, really hazy. Um, but let's 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 just go on with this. So first of all, uh, give it a good name. Uh, so I'm just going to call it birds, and I have birds, so I'm going to call it birds too. But feel free to call it whatever you want. So. Um, First of all, we need to download this data set. Um, I'm gonna, I always keep the first cell as for Python imports, so I'm just going to do it here. So uh, the code for that is um, you do an exclamation mark wget, and you pass in that link, not that link, um, the link that you copied from my website. So images.zip, we'll copy link location, there. So that what that will do is we'll download um, the uh, the zip file into your collab environment. Um, so you won't be able to really access it via file system, like a, like a file viewer or anything, but we will be uh, able to at least access it um, in the notebook. But if you go, if you go to the left-hand side, there's like a files tab and you can actually physically kind of touch things, but um, it's not as nice um, um, compared to working with a desktop file viewer. So let's just download the data set. It should run relatively quickly if you have um, uh, if you have Colab open because it's everything's in the cloud. So it's like cloud machines contacting cloud machines. So everything's good. Um, so now that we have the data set, we have to unzip it. So I'm gonna do exclamation mark unzip cub dash two hundred dash two thousand eleven dash sc dot zip and run. So to run, you can either press, there's like a play button on this side, or you can um, do shift enter. Uh, that's just as good. Um, it, it basically runs the cell. So it came up with a lot of bunch of images. As you can see, um, this output doesn't really matter to us, so we can delete it. Um, so first of all, I want to load it in a uh, in a particular way. So if we have a look in the directory, so we have CUB 200 2011, we have test, train, and validation uh, as subfolders. So if we have a look under the train folder or any of the tests or validation folders, so you would get um, a list of folders from 001 up to 200. And it gives you the names of the birds and stuff. And underneath those folders, Sorry, underneath those, <laughs> those folders are the images, are JPEG images. Um, so I'm not going to go into that for now, uh, but just know that's the file structure. So if we are given this sort of file structure, one thing that I like to do with PyTorch is to use um, TorchVision. TorchVision has a data set loader, um, uh, has a data, set, a data set container for image folders, and it just makes loading images a lot easier. So um, let's let's get started with that. So from Torch Vision, I'm gonna import. Um, uh, so sorry, it's from Torch Vision. Data sets. I'm gonna import image folder. Yep, there we go. Image folder. And what I want to pass into image folder is the root. So our root here would be. Um, CUB 200-2011, CUB-200-2011, uh, sorry, and slash train, right? So that's our root, and it asks you for a bunch of other things, but we're not going to worry about it for now, okay? So we're going to call that um, 
train images, let's say a train set. I'm going to call it train set. Um, and that's it. So if we, if we index the train set at zero, for example, you will get like a PIL, uh, a Python image basically. And you can kind of view that if you need to. So if we do, uh, so it's a tuple of like the image and the label itself. So if you have a look at the image, so it looks something like that. So it's like a picture of a duck. Um, so if you index another one, so you get a bunch of that. So what I like to do when, um, when having like an image folder like this is to use um, to use uh, Torch Vision's um, tools and, and functions to kind of like display a bunch of images at once. So I would do from torch, uh, torch Vision dot utilities import. Um, I think it's save image, and I also want to import make grid. Yes. Um, yep, and I also want to kind of pull out a batch of um, uh, images together. So that comes from the torch utilities. So from torch.utils import, uh, so sorry, from torch.data. No, from torch.utils.data, I think. Import um, data loader. Yes. So with that data loader, what I can do is have my loader, okay, let me just remove this. So we have our train set up here. What I want to do is have like a train loader, which is my um, train, uh, no, my data loader, yes. And I just pass in the data set, which is my train set. Uh, I can set a batch size, so let's pull out 64 images because why not? Um, so the way make grid and save images work is um, it takes in um, tensors. So we are going to have to start kind of forming our images in a way such that we can batch it when, when loading. So let's add a, <clears throat> a transform into our, um, our image loader so that it will kind of square it up into like a nice square size. So from torch vision, oops, torch vision import transforms. So yes. So what I'm gonna pass into the transforms uh, parameter here is I'm just gonna do transform. Actually, you know what? We're gonna do a we're gonna do a bunch of things. So we're gonna we're gonna define our own transform, which is gonna be the transforms.compose. Um, so transform.compose basically bunches a bunch of, uh, takes a bunch of um, transformations that you want to do to your image and applies it um, in sequence. So we will compose a set of transformations, which is transforms. Uh, so first of all, I want to kind of resize it so that it's the same size. So I'm going to resize it to uh, let's make it something big. I don't know, 256. No, nah, too big. Let's make it 128 by 28, 128. And uh, let's make it like that. And I want transforms. So we have to convert it to a tensor. So we just do transform dot to tensor. And that should be all we need. And we just have to pass in the transform parameter here. So what that does is it will take the image, it will resize it to 100 by 28, 100 by 20, uh, 128 by 128, and it will convert it into a tensor. Um, so if you want to see that, you can just do next iter lo uh, train loader. So train loader is kind of like a collections, kind of like an iterable type. So um, you just do next iter, and you get like a big tensor uh, that you will see. I'm just going to close this. Um, that you, that's going to come out. That's all your images batched together, and that's all the labels of the image. So right now it's not shuffled. That's why it's appearing in like order. So if you shuffle, uh, if you put a shuffle here, so shuffle equals true in the data loader, it will kind of like shuffle the images out for you. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and just take the images part. So the loader will return a tuple a tuple of images and a tuple of labels. I'm just going to take the images for now. 
So uh, next iter, sorry, next iter um, train loader. And I should get all my images into one big tensor. Good. So from here, what I like to do is kind of view it. So I would do make grid uh, and pass in the set of images. And there's a bunch of other things, but because we have it as 64 images, it's 8 squared. So we leave the end row parameter as 8. So I don't change anything there. Um, and then I just save that as image. So make grid will kind of like place all your images into a nice grid. Uh, but it's still a tensor. And then you use save image to save it as um, uh, like a PNG or something. And then I'll pass it as, I don't know, batch.png. So that's going to be my image. And uh, I'm just going to open it. And to do that, I need from Python imaging library, I'm going to import image. So because no Python notebooks worked with, uh, works with the imaging library, so all you just need to do is just image.open um, batch.png. And give it a second. There you go. So all the images are coming out now. And we can kind of get a rough view of um, what, what our images are. So I don't think I shuffled it. But let's uh, do this again. There you go. So now our images are kind of sectioned, uh, are kind of resized, and um, it turns into um, tensors. And now we can start kind of working with it. So now you kind of have an idea of what the, uh, what the layout of the data set looks like, um, how you can load the data uh, into memory. Um, and because we don't load all of it into system memory at once, we take batches of it. This is a, a very efficient way. So PyTorch, or at least Torch Vision, gives you this ability to kind of like have a, a data set that is well formed, something that you can batch through very, very easily and very, very quickly um, without all the hassle um, of you know, kind of like converting images to tensors yourself and doing all these nasty NumPy tricks. Torch Vision does, uh, does it all for you very, very easy. And the API is very, very nice. So yeah. Um, good. So uh, how is everyone following it so far? Can we, do we have any comments from our viewers? The assembly, right? Yeah, so the yeah. assembly.ae slash live. Yeah. Should probably drop drop the the. It's like it's like Facebook, you know? It started with the Facebook. <laughs> uh, so Juzer was asking, can you post a link ah, to the data set? Apologies, apologies. Yeah, so um, I'll post the link here. There you go. I'll just go back to uh, Yeah. So uh, yeah, if you, if you guys were following that, uh, or if you're not, um, okay, apologies. So you posted on the screen right now. Yeah. So. Oh, did you? Oh, you posted on the chat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I pasted it on the chat so people can uh, kind of find it. Um, really? Uh, hmm. I think it's just waiting for the chat. It's fine. Okay. All right. Okay, so back uh, cool. Oops. <laughs> I probably uh, shouldn't have turned on the video there. Anyway. Um, right. Um, so if there are no further questions, let's move on, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to the slides. Um, so um, as you might have imagined, we don't have enough data. We have about 30 images per category. So it's really hard to do neural network training from scratch. Um, but perhaps we can do something with like traditional methods. So using maybe like um, SVMs or um, decision trees. Um, so SVM is good for strong boundaries. Random forest you know, kind of minimizes overfitting if you choose your parameters correctly. Um, we still have a problem, though. Our number of features is a lot bigger than the number of samples. So we have about 5,000, 6,000 images if you divide 11,000 by half, uh, by two. 
Um, so, but the number of features we have, if we, if we take 128 by 128 by three, so if we keep a 128 by 128 pixel image, that's about uh, 128 squared, which is in the order of like tens of thousands, maybe 16,000 if I'm not wrong, um, uh, features times three. So you get about like 30,000 features. So it's a little big because we, we have this um, number, our number of features is a lot bigger than number of samples. So perhaps we can reduce the features. So one thing that I usually get to when, when I try this is maybe like remove the color uh, information altogether or keep the color information but reduce the image size down to like a really, really small size, let's say like 32 by 32 or 64 by 64. Even 64 by 64, we're looking at um, six squares, which is like 512, uh, I think by three, which is still relatively big. So let, let's start with, sorry, not 512. It's a lot bigger, right? It's like two, six, uh, okay, anyway. So 32 by 32 is about one, one, 1024. Um, so if we keep it at 32 by 32, it will be 3,000-ish um, features. So let's, let's maybe start with that and then see what kind of accuracy we get. So 3,000 features which is versus 5,000 samples, eh, we can probably do a PCA to kind of reduce it ever more. So, uh, oops, shouldn't have done that. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> uh, is my link coming in or no on the chat? Um, Still no? Uh, um, do you think you can just, I can just, I can just. Uh, just put on a link to my website um, and they, they can go to the data set section and there's like the birds data set. It should be at the top of the uh, okay. list of data sets. Awesome. Um, Right, I'm going to take off my jacket because it's a little warm here. <laughs> um, righty, righty. Okay. Um, so let's start programming our, uh, for our machine learning. So I'm just going to move a few things around just so I can make my workspace a little cleaner. How's the code coming up on screen? Is it like re legible? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, awesome. Um, right, so we're gonna make, we're gonna start with very, very small images and then we're gonna do PCA to get it even smaller. So I'm gonna resize my images to 60, no, 32, 32 by 32. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it into a tensor. Um, should we go grayscale? No, let, let's, let's keep the colors because the color information is quite important, uh, you would imagine. Um, so, yeah, let's 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 have a go at this again. So I just ran those two cells together. So now our images appear like like a very tiny square here. So now we have the images as tensors, but we really want to convert it to like a NumPy thing because Scikit-Learn. So the, the the library that we're going to use for um, SVM and random forest and stuff, we're going to use um, Scikit-Learn. Scikit-Learn is uh, part of like the SciPy. Um, world sort of thing. So it's not in Torch. So we're going to have to convert it to NumPy arrays. But it's really easy. We just do, do like a dot NumPy and then we can change everything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop through the batch of image, uh, of images and kind of like populate a list and then convert all that list into uh, a NumPy array. So for um, images, labels, and train loader. I'm going to do images.numpy, um, yeah, images.numpy, I'm going to append that into like my x array, x list, sorry, for now. And I'm going to have y append all the labels.numpy. So again, since the labels are also a torch um, tensor, we're going to have to convert it to NumPy. And because we know that y is just 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 200, we can flatten that. We don't want to flatten x because it's already well formed in like a, a tensor. But the only thing, well, 
it doesn't really matter because we're doing ML right now. We're not doing um, convolution, so we, we can flatten it. We can view it, I guess. Let's view it like this. View images.size. So images.size gives you the size of the tensor. So it, this is the images tensor will be a four-dimensional tensor because you have the number of batches, the number of channels, the number of height, uh, height pixels, width pixels, width pixels, height pixels. Um, so we're just going to get the first dimension, which is the, the batch dimension, so zero, side zero. And we're going to pass in minus one. Minus one, just like NumPy, strings out all the other dimensions together um, into one big number. So basically, we're batching. Hi. Just wanted to get the data set link. Uh, is it on your site? Yeah, it's on my site. Uh, it's under the data sets um, header. Yeah, so it, under the data sets, the topmost data set should be the, the birds data set. And they get, get the one that says images, comma, gzip, whatever. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, don't go to the original website because then you have to do the cleaning and stuff. So, um, yes, so we batch all the images and put it into like one long vector and we turn it into NumPy. Okay. So, um, and then once we have all that, we would be wise to import NumPy at this moment. And let's import our models from scikit-learn. So we're gonna, well, let's start with two. Um, let's start with three. Let's start with two. Um, I'm gonna import from scikit-learn. I'm gonna import um, the SVC. scikit-learn.svm import SVC, so our support vector classifier. Um, to make things fast, I'm going to use a linear uh, support vector classifier. Um, just because the SVM works in n squared, the number of size of data sets, um, uh, size of, uh, um, yeah, size of uh, batches, uh, size of samples, so it's going to be a little slow. Um, and then from sklearn dot, sklearn, dot uh, ensemble, I'm going to import um, random forest classifier. Yeah. And do I need anything else? Yes, I want to do PCA. So from sklearn dot decomposition, import uh, um, PCA. Yeah. And we need to scale because PCA is um, me normalize so from sklearn preprocessing we import scale scale does um, um, uh, z z scaling so normal distribution scaling um, and because I am uh, pedantic I will move my thing in order of uh, name um, yes that's all we need so let's continue so. Here, uh, we are batching our images into the X list. So now X will be a list of NumPy arrays, yes. And we just need to stack it together. So I'm going to do stack, so vertical stack into the first dimension. Um, X, yes. Um, and Y is, we can just do H stack, horizontal stack, Y. So vertical stack versus horizontal stack, because our um, vectors appears as like um, N, uh, M by N, we want to stack those M's together, right? We don't want to stack the N's together. So that's what H stack does. V stack stacks the M. H stack stacks N this way. M is this way. So. Um, let's just verify that we get the right size. So let's just print out x dot shape and y shape just so we know we are getting it correct. So give it some time. It's going to. Ah, apologies. So I should have had a y list here. There we go. So one, one thing I don't like about Colab is because it defers the computation through the net, like the delay that you get 
from sending the data back is also included in that processing. So sometimes it's really quick, it's just it takes a while to get back to you sort of thing. Um, so we have 5,994 images, 3,072 features. So that's correct, that's 32 by 32 by 3. Uh, and then we have 5,994 samples, uh, uh, labels, perfect. So now what we can do is, so the number of features is still a little big. 3,000 is a little big to work with, so we're gonna reduce it. We're gonna shrink it down using PCA. Um, so from, uh, not from, I already have PCA. So I'm gonna do number of components. I'm not gonna define my number of components, but I want to keep 98% uh, of, uh, of, the vari uh, of the variance. So I, I want to be able to retain 98% of the information, original information. So I'm gonna set it as 0 0.98. Um, that might be a little big. Okay, let's go with 97. Let's see how, how the values change. Um, that's my PCA. And I will do PCA fit transform um, X. And I'll set that as XT, X transform. Um, let's see how big xtransform.shape is. So PCA will automatically find you the nice sweet spot that gives you 97% uh, um, uh, uh, reconstruction of the original data set, uh, but then you'll get a smaller feature size um, given that. So 409, that's quite small. Uh, can we do a little bigger maybe, 98? It's not too... Um, so we, we don't want it too small because then we lose a lot of the information. But if we, um, if we can make it uh, big enough, so finding a sweet spot comes with cross-validation, but we're gonna, not gonna do that today, we just find. Okay, 536, I'm happy with that. Um, so now let's actually get into training. So I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna have my um, SVM be this linear SVM, uh, linear SVC, sorry. Um, so linear SVC does, it fits one versus rest, which means it fits 200 classifiers for our uh, case. It's like, you know, label one versus not label one, label two versus not label two. So, and then it, um, it does the fitting that way. Um, it's gonna be a little slow. So uh, given the constraints of time, I'm not gonna show you the entire training thing. Um, uh, I do have another notebook prepared to show you what kind of timings that you get uh, when, while running this, but the idea here is that we, we, want, uh, we, we want to run it uh, in a certain way. So um, fit x, y, and then we can score it. Score x, y. So um, yeah. So if we print out the score, that will tell you how well the SVM is fitted on, um, on x given, uh, given the labels y. So because we're uh, fitting on the training data, we should score relatively high on the, on the training uh, labels. So while that's running, what I want to do is maybe load in the validation data set so we can kind of get an idea of um, how our model's working on unseen data. Sorry, I knocked on the mic. Um, so I'm just gonna copy my train set, give it, call it valid set. Don't forget to change the folder to valid here. So we're gonna use the validation folders now. Keep the transform the same. I'm gonna have um, the valid loader now. And run that. And I'm just gonna copy all of this and make, um, sorry, whoops, shouldn't have done that. Um, uh, make a new thing here. Uh, from valid loader, I'm gonna populate x val, x valid, y valid. And valid, valid. Perfect. So here as well. Right. So this basically loads in the validation data, convert it down to um, into NumPy array, and then we'll do the PCA transform on it as well um, uh, while we're at it. So x transform, so I'm gonna have x valid transform is, we don't really refit the PCA, we just transform. So transform x valid. So as you can see, the SVC is still running and it's uh, gonna run for quite a bit. Um, so in the meantime, let's just um, kind of 
make our code look nice and stuff. Um, I'm just gonna change X's into X, Y, into X train, Y train, so I don't confuse myself uh, what X and Y means. Uh, so if you're wondering how I'm doing the multi uh, cursor thing, it's Alt. Uh, I hold Alt and I click on the uh, on the lines that I want to put a cursor in, and um, that allows me to kind of do things in parallel. Uh, train loader here. X color train. Oh, that should be train, right? Should be here too. Awesome. Uh, should be here too. Valid. Yeah, we probably should uh, be a bit cleaner with all this, but for for the sake of all this, you know, let's let's not worry about it too much. So SVC is still growing. Um, uh, as you might expect, it does take a while to fit 200 different classes together because it has to form 200 different regressors. Um, so I'm just going to stop it there. Um, I'll, I'll pass you guys a notebook. Actually, you know what? I'll open it up here um, to show you what kind of red stay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to open up a new tab. Uh, collab. Um, so birds, I think it's birds ML. So still running. So um, give it a second to load. Okay. So I've I've kind of like well annotated some of the parts here, so uh, it will look very similar to what we're doing um, in in our um, uh, in our version. Um, yep, 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 yep. Training with PCA features. Blah blah blah. So my linear SVM took about 264 seconds, so it's just under five minutes. Um, so it takes a while. Um, so, oh, really? Did I lose the internet connection or something? Okay, so I'm just gonna stop it. Yes. So because you know it's. Um, uh, as you can see, it takes a while, um, so maybe, but uh, I'll show you the training score I get is, well, perfect, of course, uh, but my validation score is really bad. Um, so you can kind of see uh, how, uh, how, how hard this data is to really fit, even once we've done feature reduction and all this. So um, let's try, uh, sorry, let's try our um, random forest. Random forest usually works a lot better, a lot faster. Um, I'll have to run some of these cells again. You don't have to download the data set again because um, we've already got the data set. And if you want to rerun all the notebook, just have an if statement here if um, cub 200 um in os.list there, um, then uh, not in os.list there if this. Right, so I'll have to import OS here. So if it's not in the directory, run it. Um, otherwise, um, don't. Um, yep, do my compose again, do my train loader, do my, uh, I need a validation loader. I already have a validation loader, fine. So I'll get my train data, I'll get my validation data, and I'll do the PCA. So I'm gonna have X train here. Yeah, really terrible coding. Okay. Uh, yeah, so let's get our random forest running. So our random forest would look like this classifier. Um, just so that we kind of like alleviate the overfitting, I'm going to reduce the max depth to maybe like five or something um, and then fit. It also reduces um, training time if your depth is not that big. And I'm going to have the number of classifiers be very small as well. Let's do 20 for now. 
Um, so I'm going to fit x and y, and then I'm going to score x train, y train. So in the other notebook, I actually compare the, the, um, the results against if I don't, um, uh, if I train on, um, if I train on um, the, tr uh, the PCA uh, version of the data and the non-PCA version of the data, so all 3,000 versus uh, just the 400, um, and you can you can kind of see how how much the difference is uh, in 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 that notebook. But I'll pass it on to you at the end, um, uh, just so we can uh, just so you can have a look at how uh, how long it takes to train with ML models. Um, not to say that you know networks don't train uh, don't take that long either, but you know. Um, so um, so I've done fitting here for X train and Y train T. So I'm going to score against valid um, because I expect the scoring for, you know what, let's just print it out while we're at it. So print and print. Um, so this should be train, right. And so we fit it on the training, uh, the, the PCA training data. And so is it not n classifiers? Is it num classifiers? Okay. No. What is it? Uh, num is it no? N estimators. Sorry, my bad. There you go. Y train t is not defined. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Should be y train. Y train t. Ah oh, oh yeah yeah yeah. So uh, give it some time. So, oh. okay, that uh, should not be like that. <laughs> um, let's see where we went wrong. So validation set. This is where we went wrong. We passed in our training set into the validation loader. So um, let's just refresh the validation set. So I, I had train set here just now. Um, should be valid set, which is what we loaded here from the validation folder. Um, and I'm just repopulating my validation set. There you go, 794. That's the correct size now. Uh, let's run the PCA again so we get um, the transformed um, features. And then we'll run random forest. So while we're waiting, how are the comments looking? Okay, so our comments look fine. Um, so our random forest is able to score about 10%, which is not bad, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but then our validation score is very, very low. Um, so we can do a bunch of things at this point, right? So we can roughly get about that accuracy, which is fine, to be perfectly honest, because if you are predicting at one over, so you have 200 labels, so your prediction, if you were to predict randomly, it's one over 200, which is 0 0.005, um, which is much, much lower than 0 0.09, right? So you, you're better than random, but it's not great. You know, you, uh, your, your accuracy is not great. It's close to 10%. Uh, again, it's not horrible. It's not random. So we're, we're, we're fitting. We're just not fitting well. So um, I'll pass on to you. Uh, actually, let's have a look at what um, I had for RF before. So it takes about 20 seconds. I get about 40. So this is on the transpose, uh, the, the transformed information. Um, so I get about 40, so I have max depth 5, min sample leaf 3. So again, you, you can play around with the parameters as much as you want. Um, here I have about 40% accuracy, but you know, still about 3% on, on the validation. Um, so yeah, so for SVM, um, about the same 3, oh no. Yeah, about the same, 3.5, 3.7, close enough um, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, logistic regression seems to do well. I don't know why. It always does. Um, uh, if you, and it has very few parameters to tune, so go figure. Um, but that's like the ML sort of results that we get. So 
the, the thing that we have to kind of hammer in is scalability matters. So we know that reducing features is bad because we have a lot more, a lot fewer features to work with, and a lot of these features are lost because you know we we scale things down, we remove color, we do PCA, um, and a lot of the features that we need to look out for are very fine, and we're, we'll we'll talk about more of that later on. But really, the algorithms themselves are very expensive. So. Um, Random forest and SVM, for example, is very expensive for very large features. Uh, small trees are quick, but we have to think about hyper tuning. You, you know, you have to do a lot of hyper tuning. You have to find, you explore like a grid or uh, some random space of uh, of hyperparameters that gets you the best result. It takes a lot of time. Um, Nonlinear SVM is uh, also very expensive, but again, SVM itself is very expensive for large number of features and large number of uh, examples. So can we batch train? The idea is can we batch train anywhere? So if we train for a bit, stop it, you know, train it later when we have time or when we figure out how to kind of um, uh, get more data or something. So with, um, unfortunately with, um, um, you know, neural net, uh, with, uh, with uh, traditional um, uh, models, mm, batch training is uh, difficult. So we have to look at another uh, solution. So one solution would be, uh, oh, before we go there, um, one solution would be training with neural nets, right? You, you have a neural net, you can batch train, um, and um, you, 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 you can just use the transform features from the PCA and get, um, get some results just uh, at some nonlinear fitting uh, using um, neural networks. So uh, we're not going to go down that route for now. We're going to be a bit clever, right? Let's put on our thinking caps. So the idea that we have here is that we need to find features of the image. Right now, our features are pixels. So we take individual pixels of the image, we string it out in one long vector, right? And then with that long vector, we try to do a prediction. But really, images have spatial dimensions, and we are, you know, we are kind of ignoring that. Um, and at this point, you might be thinking, ah, okay, we can do convolutional neural networks. But then, you know, I'll I'll say to you, well, hold on, convolutional neural networks are good for images, but we don't have that many examples to train a convolutional neural network fully. So maybe if we can kind of review what the, C uh, what the convolutional neural network does. So let's have a review. So a CNN or a convolutional neural network extracts spatial features from an image, right? Um, and so it will look at it, an image of that, you know, that road sign and take out you know, some features and pass it to deeper layers, pooling and uh, convolutions to get uh, even more features and even more features and so on and so forth. Right? At, at some point, you get like very small features, like very, very small squares uh, after convolution and pooling. But then these, uh, these small, square, small squares would contain very, very high information, very, very high level representations of the original image, which then this, uh, the classifier can use. So if you think about it, the classifier is nothing more than a neural net. Right? Uh, it's just a, it's just a nonlinear fit. So you can really substitute the neural net for something else, um, as long as you can maintain these features, right? So if we can somehow get the features that the convolutional neural nets generated, then we can really pass in any machine learning model aside from the neural net at this end, right? So deeper in the, um, in the convolutional neural network, or the CNN, you get all these nice images, uh, nice features that really conform to, you know, things like curves and uh, shapes. But even deeper, you get things like eyes and noses and mouths and cars and you know windows and things like that. That really forms up whole images. Um, and really, what we want to maybe take is uh, is this very deep features uh, and use them somehow, right? So. Why don't we do that? You know, we we can use some pre-trained network, something that people have trained online that is available, um, 
extract the features of those neural net and you know use them for our machine learning models, right? So um, let's do that. So um, right. So what we want to do essentially, right? So if we have an image of our bird, we pass it to some pre-trained network and get our convolution features pass it through another convolution, another convolution, blah, 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 and so on and so forth throughout the entire um, neural net and get these features out at the other end. So these features don't mean much to us, but to a machine learning model, this is gold. This is something that they can use to kind of fit the data very, very well. So um, let's do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a neural net that's already pre-trained. Um, so it has this neural, uh, a, a CNN that's already pre-trained. Remove this layer, this uh, classification layer uh, that is a neural net. Uh, and at this max pooling layer, we can maybe like convert it to average pool or do something. Get the features out from there and then pass it to your favorite machine learning model. SVMs, random forests, whatever you want. Right? So uh, let's do this. Let's actually code this up in, uh, in Colab. So first, before I do anything here, um, we need to think about pre-processing. So images that are trained in other networks might not be pre-processed the same way that we did. So in our, um, in our data set, we have this train transform here. I'm just going to zoom in. A bit. So what we did is we passed in a transform that looks like this. So we did a 32 by 32 resize, and then we converted it to tensor. Um, that's probably not the way that other models have been uh, tr uh, trained with. So we need to do some uh, some digging and stuff. And if you do the digging on the PyTorch website, you'll find out that they resize images to 224 by 224. Um, uh, to train uh, to train the the um, the convolutional neural networks, and they do a bunch of other pre-processing, but really the important one is this normalization. So we're going to have a transforms dot normalize. So um, and then you're going to pass some mean and standard value. So the mean is going to be some value that I always don't remember. So I always um, go and look for it in my um, in my uh, other notebooks. Are we in the right notebook? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I need to find. Sorry, I was in the wrong notebook. <laughs> um, right, we should be here. We resize it into 32 by 32. I'll keep this because this is a notebook that I want to share with you guys. So I better not change this. Um, 32 by 32 into 224 by 224. Right? So at the compose, we resize it that way. And then we need to normalize. Transforms, sorry, transforms.normalize. Normalize. Um, I keep forgetting these values, but um, these are the normalization values that they use. So I'm just going to. Look it up online. Um, so, torch, uh, PyTorch, um, ImageNet, uh, pre processing. And uh, I think I've gone to this page like a billion times. Um, mm, no, not this page. I think it might be this one. Uh, but it's basically three values for the mean and three values for the standard deviation that, um, there we go. That's what we need. So I'm just going to copy that. Um, so I'll, I'll read it out to you when we're here. So it's 0 0.485, 0 0.456, 0 0.406 for the mean, 0 0.229, 0 0.224, and 0 0.225 for the standard deviation. Um, so uh, if you go if you go on Google, find those values. Um, uh, you can kind of like copy and paste. Otherwise, just stare at the screen for a bit. Um, so once we've gotten that, we need to load our model. 
our uh, pre-trained convolutional neural network. Now, luckily, um, PyTorch, uh, at least TorchVision, comes with a lot of pre-trained models that we can use. And so, um, I think in my slide, what did I choose to use? Right. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we're we're gonna do uh, the pre-processing. We're gonna leave it there uh, for now, and we're gonna talk about this whole idea of transfer learning, right? So transfer learning, um, really what we did is we use a pre-trained network on a similar task, which is ImageNet classification, and we use it for our task. So um, we minimize overfitting on small data set when we are training this new model, and we minimize training time because we can already get like a small amount of features to use. Can we get a higher accuracy? Possibly, uh, but it's already very popular. Uh, if you haven't heard of transfer learning, then you just probably haven't heard of what it is in the veneer of what, it, uh, what the methods are. So one thing that's very popular is style transfer. Um, so what it does is it uses a pre-trained network and it adjusts the images to match a certain style. Um, so it, for example, if you, want, if you wanted a photograph of a house to look like a painting of Van Gogh, you would use style transfer to do so. So what it does is it uses a kernel information in uh, CNNs and it uses that as a similarity metric and it minimizes the simil uh, or it maximizes the similarity, i.e. minimizing the difference. So it looks something like this. So you have an input image which the style uh, um, that you want and uh, the actual image that you want to apply that style into. And it takes the convolution information and then it finds the difference of those style representations between the two images and you try to minimize this difference, i.e. maximizing the similarity. So it's a big loss function, but I encourage you to read the paper. It's very easy to follow and very easy to implement, actually. Um, yeah. Another one that uses transfer learning is word to vec So word to vec is um, uh, a, a word embedding um, uh, uh, network. So it takes in a bunch of words and it converts it into some vector form in, you know, in high dimension. And because it's trained in a certain way, it has some, um, some, uh, some semantic value to those, uh, to those vectors. And people use it for sentence generation, review, classification. It's used as like you know the the main thing in language models nowadays. Um, uh, so the way it works is you know you you put in a bunch of words and then um, it learns to contextualize each word in uh, around the words that um, uh, that follow it. So pineapples are spiky and yellow. So it, it will learn to correlate R with spiky and with spiky pineapples with spiky yellow with spiky. So um, you know, so really, you want to correlate pineapples and spiky. R because it's a very common word gets lost and becomes like a vector of you know just just something simple. Um, um, and you train it in that way. So and then once you're done training the model. Um, what you can do is pass in um, a word, and then it will it will go through um, this hidden layer, and the and the output of the hidden layer is what you take out as um, as the features, right? Similarly, that's what we're going to do with the CNN. We're going to pass it through the neural network, and whatever the information is in the hidden layer, we're going to pull it out, and we're going to use it. So, um, one last thing um, before we go uh, go on to coding. I think, uh, yeah, we go on to coding next. What we do is, um, what we can do in transfer learning is mix convolutional neural networks and uh, recurrent neural networks. This is a work by uh, Andre Karpathy, which is like one of the biggest guys in machine learning right now, is to c uh, transform an image through a convolutional neural network and then pass it, pass that convolution information into the hidden, uh, to, to pre-populate the, the hidden, um, uh, hidden layer of a recurrent neural network, and then you train it that way. So because we have the hidden information as the encoding of the pixels, we, we can kind of use that to kind of, uh, kind of extract out important information, so straw hat. And Karpathy has done um, some amazing, amazing stuff. So, and I think the method works really, really well, too. So, um, so what are we going to do? right? 
what we're going to do is we're going to load the image. We're going to pre-process. I think I got ahead of myself with the code, so apologies for that. So we're going to load the image. We're going to pre-process it according to the ImageNet pre-processing. We've kind of done that already, but I'll go over it again. We're going to load a pre-trained model. We're going to use ResNet uh, for a particular reason that I'm not going to go into now. Um, set it to evaluation mode. We're going to remove the head and we're going to pass the image through this really deep network. So ResNet looks like this. It has this bunch of skip connections, but it has really, really useful features. Much better than, let's say, AlexNet or VGG. Um, and then we're going to train it with the ML models, right? Okay. So let's actually get to coding here. So um, with our transforms, I'm going to save myself uh, by removing that for now. Um, I'm going to save myself uh, by yes. Yes. Um, so let's, let's talk about um, the, the pre-processing. So like I said, we need to resize and normalize to the same pre-processing that the neural net has, um, uh, has been trained on. So uh, fortunately, it's very simple, the pre-processing. It's just resizing to 224 by 224 pixels. And then we do this normalization based on this vector, which you can find on, uh, on like the PyTorch website. But um, yeah. So uh, and we don't need to do any changes to our data set because we're not actually you know, hand uh, engineering anything uh, onto the images. And this is how you know, PyTorch kind of makes the workflow very, very, uh, very, very smooth. Because we can change very few parameters to kind of get the result that we need. Next, what I want to do is load in uh, the models. So uh, we're going to use ResNet. So from torchvision.models, I'm going to import ResNet. We're going to use 34 um, because it's not as big as a 50. Um, and actually the output layer is 512 by, uh, it's a hidden layer of 512, which is about the same as our PCA value, which was about 560 something. So we, I wanted to kind of get like an, a fair comparison in terms of feature size when we're, when we're doing training. So ResNet is about 512 output. So we're, um, so it's kind of like a fair comparison in terms of training time. Um, but you're going to see there's going to be a big jump in, um, in training accuracy. So we're going to load, uh, so there's, there's two, yeah, uh, I'm, uh, ju just for technicality, there's a ResNet in capital. Let's, don't load that, load ResNet 34, okay? So uh, uh, yeah, just to remove clutter, I am going to remove this image. Again, all of this you can find in the notebook that I'm going to pass to you uh, at the end of this. Uh, I should not have deleted that cell. So I'm going to yeah, keep these guys because we still need to um, flatten and shrink the images. Uh, you know what? We actually don't, so to hell with this. Uh, let's, let's just keep it because I think I, I will need it uh, for something. I'm going to remove the PCA SVM random forest. Okay. So um, we have our image. Let's load up our model. So our ResNet, uh, we're just going to call it CNN, is going to be ResNet 34. And what's important is we pass in pre trained equals true. So that loads up the pre trained uh, weights of the neural net. Um, and then we can just use it uh, immediately. So we first need to set it to evaluation mode, eval. And um, we do cnn. Dot, no, that's it, cnn.eval. So puts it in evaluation mode. So some models have batch norm layers and have dropout. And dropout is different when you do training and when you do testing or when you do evaluation. We need to set it to evaluation mode so it's, um, it's correct. Um, Right, so uh, the other thing is we only, let, let's have a look at what the neural net looks like in PyTorch, um, ResNet at least. So you can see there's a bunch of blocks. There's like basic block, sequential, basic block, basic block. Uh, really what we want to look at is um, up to this average pool um, section. So it does some average pooling. Of, uh, of the image, and then there's like a fully connected layer, which is just um, a 512 to 1000. So it's just like a logistic uh, regression thing that happens at the end. 
really, we want to extract the features of this 512. So just for the ResNet in particular, we have to do something special um, because, because of this skip connection. The, the, forward, um, the forward functionality is not obvious, so we actually have to keep the forward functionality the same, but we just change the output layer, this FC. We're going to change it to just an identity layer. So an identity layer just basically takes any information out from the average pool and keep it as is. It's basically multiplying a matrix of one, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an identity matrix, right? So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to convert this FC section here into an identity layer. So luckily for PyTorch, it's very easy. So what we can do is cnn.fc. So we, we just take the FC layer. Is um, I'm going to do nn.identity. So uh, identity. So NN is uh, PyTorch's neural network library, which I haven't loaded. That's why it's not there. So from uh, torch, import NN. Um, so yeah, import NN. So I do NN.identity, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, identity. And we don't need to pass in any values. And now if we have a look at our CNN, you will see the FC layer at the end be an identity. Right. So um, when I pass in an image into, uh, into the CNN, um, I will, let, let's just do some, uh, some random image. So ran n um, one by, sorry, one by three by two, two, four by two, two, four. So it expects that size, but because of the average pooling, you can actually use any size, but we're, we're just gonna keep it at two, two, four by two, two, four. Um, if I pass in an image, Silly, I should have imported torch. Import torch. Okay. Um, yeah. So if I do that. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is torch. This is not numpy. It's just torch at random. Apologies. So I should get this really big vector, but the vector should be 512 by 512. So if I do that size, I should get, yep, yeah, 1 by 512. So basically, it's just taken um, whatever the output of um, the ResNet is. So just to see that in, um, so basically, we've done the average pooling here. There's a fully connected layer. We removed the fully connected layer from the ResNet, and we've just added an identity layer. So anything, any features that comes out of the average pool is what we're going to get, right? Right, so, 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 so. Now that we have the CNN uh, being able to predict on images, so we'll, let's try on one image and uh, make sure it's working. So uh, I'm just going to make a new thing here. So I'm going to have uh, images equal, um, well, images slash label. Uh, I'm not going to take the label, but I'm going to do next, iter uh, valid loader or train loader, whatever you want. Um, and we're going to pass in CNN uh, images. So CNN works like a function, so you just pass, uh, pass the images. And then we can just have a look at the output size. So because our batch size is 64, we get 64 here, and we get 512 as the output, which is the size of the features. Perfect. So now, these... Uh, these features right now, this 512 features, are still a, um, a torch tensor. We need to convert it into NumPy so that we can use it with our scikit-learn models. Um, so I am going to, um, yes, I am going to do this. So we have our data loaded into the data loader. So all we need to do I'm going to keep that. All I'm going to do is pass um, output is equal to CNN images. So that's our, our, our output features, right? Um, yeah, features. Let's call it features. 
Um, and then what I want to do is append into X train just the features dot numpy. Right. So we'll pass in the features, convert it into a numpy, uh, numpy array, put it into X. And because it's already batched in this sort of way, 64 by 512, I don't need to do any reshaping or resizing. Uh, we'll just keep it that way, and then we'll stack it vertically like we did before. Right, um, let me just uh, make sure I have run this recently. Normalize has some error. Oh yeah, I need a comma. Yep, so now I, my training set and my training loader should be 224 by 224. Um, and if I pass through here, it's gonna run and uh, generate. So you know what? Um, just a nice thing so we can kind of view how, how long it's taking. I'm going to load in um, uh, TQDM uh, from TQDM for TQDM notebook. TQDM is just um, a nice way to kind of uh, show like a progress bar for loops and stuff. Um, and I'm just going to do TQDM notebook here. So it's taking a while. Whoops. Ah, yeah, of course. Uh, one thing that you should remember is that um, because PyTorch is like fully gradient thing, and you pass, you do a forward uh, a forward pass through the neural net, you still have the gradients attached. Um, we can do like remove dot var dot detach and stuff, but uh, what I like to do is with torch dot no grad. It's actually a cleaner solution um, because you use um, you use the with um, uh, clause and keeps everything nice. Um, so right, let's just wait for those images to pass through. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's let's have some questions. Um, I'm gonna switch to my. Yeah. Uh, yes. Can you write down the name of the paper again? Will this code? Yeah. So all the code will be posted online, um, and, and all the slides will be up as well. So you guys will find uh, all the link to the papers and all all the code uh, freely available. Um, I know right now it's like a little bit of a mess. I have a really nice clean notebook that is well structured um, that you guys can kind of refer to uh, at the end. But if you guys are following along, you'll see similar things in the other notebook just with like formatting and um, writing and uh, a lot cleaner um, output. Um, any other thing? Uh, yeah. The name of the paper, um, let's, yeah, let's head back to that. Uh, paper. So there's this Carpathi paper, which uh, uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's like online representation or something. But I think uh, this transfer learning paper, it's, uh, it's just called, I think, um, style transfer, image style transfer, something like that. But uh, again, all, all, these, all these links are on, uh, on the slide, so you, 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 won't, um, uh, you won't be hard pressed. Not yeah, yeah. So it's all in the slides. It's all there. Um, but it's like image style transfer or something by Leon Gattis. Um, uh, yep. Uh, it's taking a while. Um, there's a way to speed it up. Um, so let's do that, huh? Because. I'm not waiting eight seconds for a, for a single iteration. So what's happening here is our models are executing on CPU. So because it's a very deep model, um, the CPU cycles take you know, a lot of time to kind of process it. Uh, it'd be good if we had a GPU, and luckily we do. So Colab um, allows us to um, use a, a, a GPU runtime. So if you go to runtime at the top, go to change runtime type, uh, and it says hardware accelerator, you can switch that to GPU. And what you can do, uh, well, you don't get it for free. 
Uh, you still have to add a few more code. So um, uh, what you need to do is uh, have a device. So I'm just gonna do it close to the top because that's where I usually do it. So um, um, so I will do device is equal to torch dot device um, CUDA colon zero. That's how you do it. There's like a dot CUDA thing that you do, but it again. Um, clean code versus dirty code sort of thing. Um, so what I usually do is I will do kind of this line when I, whenever I start. So if torch.cuda dot is available. So it will check if your machine has CUDA or not. And uh, otherwise you just default to CPU. Um, so this, this, this type of code then will not fail in any other, uh, in other, any other machine when you try to do training and stuff. Um, so because we've restarted the runtime, we have to actually re-download the whole thing and um, oh, I don't want to see too many outputs. So we have to download the data set again, but uh, uh, the, the process is relatively quick, so let, uh, let's just let it happen. So it's extracting the zip file. Okay, good. So now we have our device. Let's just print out, make sure that we are on CUDA. Perfect. So if your device says device type is, uh, uh, type is equal to CUDA, that means you have GPU enabled. Um, all you need to do is run the rest as the same. Um, but uh, what you want to do here when you do your CNN is to do CNN dot two device, uh, so that will bring the CNN to uh, to work on GPU, and then we have to do a bit of acrobatics here. So we have to convert the image to device because um, it is always in CPU first, and then you have to push it up to GPU, uh, and then once the features are done, the features are on the GPU because it's uh, an output of the images and the neural net, which is both on the GPU. So you have to convert the features to CPU. Luckily, it's quite simple. You just do features.cpu, and then you convert it to NumPy. Uh, we don't need to do it for Y, for the labels, because the labels don't get passed to the GPU. So um, let's run this now. And you'll see <laughs> significant speed up. Uh, because you know you're predicting on GPU, so prediction it still matters for GPU versus CPU, uh, but um, uh, training it matters even more. So, um, but you can get a significant speed up by using GPU versus CPU. All right, uh, let's do the same for our um, for our validation set. So. Uh, Really dirty coding habits here, but uh, bear with me. I'm going to move this forward and then with torch.no grab. Okay, so that's all the same. Uh, I pass the images to the device, pass it to the CNN, get the features, pass it into X valid. Yep, everything looks good. Let's do that. So because the images are loaded from valid loader now, so okay, that was quick. So we now have a data set uh, which is 5,994 by 512, and 5,994 uh, uh, 794 by 512. So that's our um, new training data set. Now let's you know get back to our SVM and our. Um, um, so we don't have to do PCA now because our feature size is, is relatively small already, but let's uh, create our. Um, linear support vector machine um, and fit it. Fit x train, y train, and let's score it. Print out how well is it doing now. So if you remember from last time, the training score is very, very high, but I think we were averaging about 3.5%, 3.7% for, um, the, for the validation. So let's see what it is now. Uh, go. And 
I will have the same, but for random forests, random forest classifier, classifier, and my n estimators, I'm going to have, well, let's have about the same 30 or 20, was it? And max depth is 5. And this is my random forest. I fit my random forest and I score them. Um, as usual, linear SVM takes a while. Okay, not that bad. But wow, so we've jumped from around 3 or 4% to 60% um, accuracy now with, uh, with our linear uh, classifier, which is a massive improvement. And our, you know, the size of our data set, uh, the size of features that we have is a lot smaller because with our PCA we had about 560 uh, or so features. Um, and uh, now we're, we're getting about, you know, 60% uh, accuracy, which is a massive jump. And, you know, you can think of this as it's getting about maybe 100 or so, 120 or so of the labels correctly predicted, right? Um, uh, on average. So it, it's guessing a lot less, uh, but uh, it's guessing a lot better now. Uh, it, it's, it's predicting a lot better now. So with the random forest classifier, let's see how it does with the validation set. Again, like I said, you can do fine tuning at this moment. You can do hyperparameter tuning, you know, search, search the entire space for, for better results and stuff. So 20%, I'm not surprised. I didn't, you know, I, I, pick, I pick these numbers out of a hat. So um, uh, I'm not expecting it to do well, but if you do hyperparameter tuning, you know, at this point you can go, uh, you can go quite far. So um, yeah, so let's recap what we did. So first, we had, um, uh, we had our pre-processing, which happens here. So we need to resize it to 224 by 224 because that's how it's trained. And then we normalize it because this is the pre-processing that's done on ImageNet. So to keep all the images the same, this is what you should do first. Second is we loaded our pre-trained network. And then we have to always set it to evaluation. So this is important. Um, but um, I, I've put this out on, on the notebook that we'll share with you guys at the end, um, that this is particularly important because it has batch norm layers, it has dropout layers, and these things can mess with your prediction if you don't set it to eval. Uh, we set it to device for GPU to speed up, and we, all, uh, we set the final layer, the fully connected layer, to identity. Um, not all the models can do this, uh, like just set the final layer to identity. We'll look at VGG when we're retraining VGG later on to see how we can, um, we can actually do this with other models. So um, stay put. Uh, and then we passed in our training images. We compute the features of those images by passing it through the CNN. And then we converted those features to NumPy. Same for the validation data set. And then once that's done, you just pass it through your favorite classifier, linear SVM, random forest, whatever you want and you can already start getting a prediction. And there you go, you're, you're getting somewhere with, uh, with your, um, uh, with your uh, transfer learning classifier. And you're, you've already you know, gone quite a far away from using traditional models uh, and traditional pixels, converting pixel values into vectors, uh, and instead use, uh, converting image-specific values into image-specific um, vectors. So this is kind of like the word to vec idea. You convert a word into a vector in high, uh, in high or low dimensional space, depending on what you want, but you want to keep the salient features of that image uh, in that final vector that you use for classification, right? So at this point, I'll go back to the slides and say, well, we, 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 we've gone quite far. Uh, we've done uh, transfer learning using a, 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 res, uh, a ResNet layer, which we really we, don't, we didn't have to understand how the ResNet works. We just care about what the features that the ResNet has to give us. We, we just want the features. We've used a very deep neural network without really needing to understand how it's done it. You know, we just take the important features that we need from it. But let's take it one step further, right? Um, uh, at this point, maybe I should check on questions if there are any. Uh, where are my questions? Nope, just the same? Okay, cool. Everyone's following along. Uh, is there a break or is there no break? 
because usually I take a break at this point. <laughs> okay. Sure. Um, number one. Uh, it doesn't work. I'll, I'll do the whole thing. Number two, yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess we're, we're going for a break now. Cool. Cool. Um, so we'll be right back with you guys. I uh, hope you guys will stay along because we're going to... So you've done, we've done the transfer learning to ML now, but we've got a lot more that we can do with transfer learning to kind of even push that 60% up. So can we maybe get closer to 70% where at that point, you know, we, we, we should really um, have a very strong model to use in, uh, in any use case. So if you would like to find out how to push that extra 10%, stay with us. Cool.
Awesome. Cool. Uh, welcome back. Um, just got a short break and um, hope you guys are still tuning in. So in the last um, episode, we were at transfer learning and we've transferred our deep learning model down into a machine learning model. So the way we did that is we use a pre-trained model, took an image, process it through the uh, convolutional neural net and get the features of the CNN out at the other end, use those CNN features to do classification. So, uh, and what we got in, uh, with the linear SVM at least is about 60% accuracy. So um, let's take it one step further with the ML model and let's see if we can do better than 60% or how we might maybe approach getting better than 60%. So let's get back to the slides that we were on, um, which is here. Yes. So the question is, will it batch? So what we did um, with, the CNN, uh, with, uh, with our machine learning features are we, we are still passing it through um, models that will not batch, right? So SVM and um, um, random forest are models that depend on the entirety of the data set to be, um, to be optimized together. So it's a global optimization method or search method that finds, um, uh, that finds a solution to modeling a, a data set. So, uh, and that becomes a problem when we have images uh, or a, a data set that's very, very large. So ideally we want something that will batch um, or train in batches um, uh, to be exact. So naturally one that comes to mind is anything that learns from gradients because um, you, we, we know that sto uh, stochastic gradient data set work because we can learn from batches of uh, example in things like neural net. So ML's, ML models do not batch. We know that for, for a fact. Uh, but neural nets do, right? So one might think, okay, let's uh, get those features again, take our uh, scikit-learn library and train a neural net from scratch and get that. But really that's no different than hyperparameter tuning uh, a random forest, which might be faster because um, you know, the random forest takes about 20 seconds to compute. And if you do some really smart hyperparameter tuning using let's say hyperopt or something, you can really accelerate that learning process to, to get a high uh, accuracy, hopefully. Um, so we know that neural nets do um, uh, learn better. So why can't we do something like this? Remember that convolutional neural net head that we chopped off to get those features, i.e. this part of the neural net that we chopped off? Well, that's a neural net, right? So um, why can't we just retrain that part? So it's already like trained, right? So we, we, we get a neural net that is already pre-trained. Uh, so these weights are fixed, but we can kind of like fine tune it to our data. Um, why can't we do that? You know, just like retrain the classifier part, freeze all the convolutional part, and just focus on retraining this part. So we know that in, 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 the, in the model that this works and it gives us a higher accuracy. So if we fine tune this to our task, because uh, in, the other, uh, in the original network it was used to predict like a thousand different labels, but we only have 200 different labels of birds, which is different label fixes. So we can't really use the neural net as is, but we can fine tune it, right? We can swap out the last layer um, uh, as a fresh layer but keep the rest of the neural net the same, right? So we'll, we'll keep it small, but we'll keep it well regularized so we, we, don't, um, we don't overfit, right? So let's do that then. So um, at this point, I will clear out all this machine learning stuff. So RF classifier, again, all this code will be provided to you guys um, later. 
Um, so don't worry if you miss out. We're, we're going to have it all prepared for you guys and you guys can follow along. Um, I won't need this conversion anymore because we're just going to start with here at the ResNet. So ResNet is a massive model. And it's actually more difficult to train because it has a bunch of uh, batch norm layers and it has all these skip layers. So, um, uh, but the classifier, as we see at the end, is, um, is just a linear regression layer. So it's no point fine tuning those. You can, I mean, it, it doesn't help, uh, it doesn't hurt, but just for the sake of um, trying out another model, Let's let uh, let's let's look at another model that we can maybe fine tune. Um, actually, ResNet might be an uh, an ideal case to fine tune, but we'll come to that maybe uh, a bit later. Let's try to fine tune another model. So um, a popular model that won uh, that kind of like shook the ground of um, image uh, image classification during the 2014 um, ImageNet large scale visual recognition competition was AlexNet. So AlexNet was developed by Alex Krzyzewski in his seminal paper. And uh, luckily someone uh, posted up, uh, well, uh, the, the PyTorch community kind of retrained the AlexNet on the ImageNet data set and uh, put it up for us to play with. So let's have a look at AlexNet um, and all its layers. So let's convert our CNN here to AlexNet. Pre-trained is equal to true. Uh, we'll set it to eval and let's just have a look at um, the CNN itself. So it's going to download and you might notice that um, here. So it's a very simple neural net to understand just by looking at the code. So it says AlexNet is a, uh, it contains a features component which is just a sequential. So a sequential in PyTorch is just an, uh, a, a, a set of operations that, uh, that operate one after another. So there's nothing special going on. It's just one after the other, after the other, after the other. So with sequential, you pass through a convolution, a relu, a max pool, a convolution, a relu, a max pool, a convolution, a relu, a convolution, a relu, a convolution, relu, and max pool. So it's kind of like a poem, like A, B, A, B. A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, A, B, A, B, C. <laughs> so it's like kind of like a poem. You can kind of read it like that. But basically, it's a very small neural network in terms of, um, in terms of depth. But uh, it actually has a lot of parameters. Um, I uh, wonder if I can uh, ah, forget about it. But if I remember correctly, there's like millions of parameters, maybe, close, uh, close, uh, maybe a more than a million parameters in, uh, in the AlexNet. Largely because you can kind of see there's like um, um, you know a big matrix multiplication here by nine thousand by four uh, four thousand. But anyway, we have the feature section, and then we have the average pooling, and then there's a classifier section where it passes through nine thousand features, four thousand ninety six, four thousand ninety six, four thousand ninety six, four thousand ninety six, and then one thousand. So you can kind of see this half of the of the uh, model is basically a neural net, right? So you have a linear features which input 4,000 and outputs 4,000, and uh, a linear that is 4,000 by 1,000. So that's basically a neural net, right? Uh, what can we do? Well, let's kind of change this layer, or maybe fine tune it, and we'll change this layer so that it's an output to, to, uh, to, um, to the number of classes that we need. So because we have 200 uh, birds in our data set, uh, we need to set this output features to 200, but that ultimately means we have to uh, remove that linear layer altogether, right? So, uh, well, not really. We, we can do continual learning and stuff, but I won't go there yet, um, or not in this talk at least. Uh, so what we're going to do is just remove this part, the sixth uh, component of the classifier, the sixth uh, sequential component of the classifier layer, and we're gonna only train this part, the, the 4,000 by 4,096. We're gonna freeze the rest of the, um, of the AlexNet. So the way we do that is um, to freeze a neural network for training. It's relatively simple. So uh, we have our AlexNet here. 
So what we want to do is before we do the eval, before we put it to device, we need to kind of set it to, uh, to free some of the parameters. So to do that is we do four parameters, four params in, or four param in parameters, parameters. Uh, which parameters? Well, alexnet dot features dot parameters. So what I'm saying here is get me the features, uh, the features component of uh, alexnet and the parameters of those components and do a loop and for each of the parameters, we do param dot requires, oops, requires grad equals false. So what this means is um, we set these parameters to not require a gradient. So when we, do a forward, uh, when we do a backward pass, these guys, since these guys don't have a gradient, they, get, they don't get updated, right? Essentially freezing the neural net, uh, the, the convolution part. So what we, also want to freeze is the first linear layer of um, the, the classifier um, because it's like a big thing and we don't really want to train all that, uh, all, those, um, uh, all those features. Um, so uh, we, we don't have to freeze other things like the dropout because dropouts don't, uh, don't really have a, a, a differentiable parameter in it, neither does ReLU. Uh, it's just an activation function, so we don't have to worry about it. So we just have to worry about this first layer in the classifier. So what we can do is for param in alexnet dot classifier dot parameters, uh, classifier one, so the first one, so the way we index all those zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, these guys, is we just uh, index it as if it was a list. So alexnet dot classifier dot one uh, classifier bracket one dot parameters, and we set that to requires grad to false. Okay, so I don't want to set this guy to false because we want to retrain this layer, the fourth layer, but I need to change the sixth layer so that we can output two hundred uh, features rather uh, two hundred labels rather than one thousand. So the way I do that is for, uh, not for param, we just need to do um, alexnet.classifier number six, the last layer, the output layer, is I'm gonna define a new linear, which is 4096 by 200, which is the number of features that we have output. So let's recap that. We've frozen the entirety of the features, which is the, the convolutional part of the model. And then what we're doing is we're freezing the first linear layer of the classifier. We're fine tuning the second linear layer of the classifier. And we have an entirely new linear layer of the uh, output layer of the classifier, right? Um, so the, the, the middle hidden layer is fine-tuned. The output hidden layer is trained from scratch. So really we're only training from scratch this last parameter, uh, this last linear layer. And the, in, uh, the, the, the middle hidden layer is fine-tuned, right? So let's do that. Um, we don't want to evaluate, um, but we still need to put it to device, right? So we're done for here. Uh, we, we've set all the parameters that we don't want to train, essentially freezing the network. And all we need to do now is just have a training loop, right? So, oops, function, object. Ah, not AlexNet, sorry, CNN. AlexNet is the function that we used to. Um, CNN classifier, there we go. Okay, error again. AlexNet has no classifier. There we go. Perfect. So it doesn't say that it's uh, not, um, it's frozen or uh, not requires grad or anything, but um, if you check it one by one, it will say like requires grad is false. Um, cool. So let's have our training loop. Um, but before that, mm, 
Right. Okay. So um, let's set our optimizer and our criterion. So our optimizer, uh, our, our criterion to measure the loss is uh, nn dot uh, cross entropy loss because that's what we want. And our optimizer, we can choose whatever. I'm going to use Adam, um, optim dot Adam, because um, it's relatively fast. And all we need to do is just CNN dot parameters. Cool. So um, let me just import the optim library from Torch. and set my criterion and optimizer. And then let's have my training loop. So for images, labels in uh, my train loader. Train loader. I'm going to do um, train uh, images uh, to device to device. Uh, oops, and then labels as well. So because uh, all of this is going to happen on the GPU, we're going to have to move it up to the GPU. Remind, yeah. So CNN is already moved to device here, so that's fine. Um, and then uh, I just need to pass it through CNN images. So we'll get our output, and we have to find our loss would be the criterion of the output and our labels, and we'll just print the loss for now. So we have to print loss.item because um, uh, the loss is in a tensor, so we just have to take the value of the tensor um, rather than printing out the, uh, the tensor itself. Um, and then with the loss, I want to do backward to propagate back the errors, and then on my optimizer, we step so before we do the backward, always remember to do optimizer dot zero grad. So we turn off all the gradients that has been passed in the last um, in in the last training uh, training batch, so that we don't accumulate all the gradients and, and do a backward pass. Um, yeah, that should be good. I want maybe a loop for my number of epochs e in range number of epochs. So I'm going to set my number of epochs just above here. Is uh, let's do let's do ten for now. Just keep it small to debug this thing. Um, and at the end, I want to print loss uh, at every step. Should I? No. Nah. We'll we'll just print the the training loss at the end. But I want to kind of, because we have a validation set, we can actually um, kind of evaluate our classifier at every training epoch. So for images, uh, so at the end, we have to do, so at the end of the training loop, I want to uh, evaluate my model so far on the validation set. And to do that, we have to actually set it to eval mode. So um, cnn.eval. And then we do the whole with torch dot no grad. We don't want to do any gradients. Um, uh, and then we have to kind of have this loop for the validation set. Um, so valid loader, images to images, loss, criterion, blah, 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 blah. And I just want to see the loss of the validation set. Um, at the end of the validation, we have to set it to train again. So CNN.eval, CNN.train changes the training mode of the CNN. So evaluation mode, it's for testing. Training mode, you, you get the gradients uh, propagating again and stuff properly. And uh, you always need to, to do the switch every time you train, uh, every time you do eval. Right. So. Um, I think that looks good. Um, I'm just going to pass in some progress bars to make it look nice. And there we
there we go, we're off. So that's the training um, progress. And then the validation progress will be another bar below once it's done one iteration. So yeah, so as, as the model is training, we have an error. Element zero of tensors does not require grad, does not have grad function. Ah, yeah, of course, we, we don't have grad here, so we're not doing any backwards or optimizers here. Uh, what we can do is get accuracy. Um, and the accuracy is basically output.argmax dimension one. So um, because our, our output is um, uh, a set of real numbers, and what, what softmax does is basically maximized, uh, maximizes the value. It's just as good if we wanted to do, um, um, if we wanted to do accuracy just to find the maximum value of that, uh, of that output. Um, so output or argmax uh, dimension is one um, because we, um, we do argmax this way rather than this way in the, in the output uh, tensor. Um, and then we want those labels, so output argmax gives you the labels in numbers, so 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 200. We want those to equal labels, um, and we just want the mean, torch.mean of those similarities. Um, so because the similarities will be binary, we actually have to convert them to float so that mean works. Um, yeah. So I think this should be fine. So print loss.item. So I'm gonna print out a bunch of things. I'm gonna print out what epoch it is. Epoch is uh, percent zero three D. And then um, loss or yeah, loss is percent point five F um, and my uh, accuracy is also percent point five f. So just formatting stuff percent. So the first is our epoch, which is e plus one. And then our loss would be uh, loss dot item and accuracy would be accuracy dot item. Cool. So let's see if this trains. Oops error there. Um, oh yeah, one more bracket. Um, let's kind of reset our model because we've kind of trained it from one epoch already, so uh, I just want something clean. Cool. So it got in, it's going to go on training. Sure, while it trains. Uh, cool, cool, cool. Uh, let me have a look at what you guys. How can you choose an optimum number of layers for your model and use case? Uh, can you elaborate more on the zero grad? Okay, so I'll, uh, I'll answer the optimum number of layers. Um, the short answer is um, the one that maximizes your validation, uh, uh, the, the one that minimizes your validation loss. Um, and how you choose it is, well, just try what works. Um, in the case of my, um, of my problem here, uh, wh wh when I was doing the bit grid uh, competition, was um, to find a small enough model that regularizes well. So finding like, uh, so rather than 4096, I would maybe choose 1024 in, this, uh, in the hidden layer to kind of minimize the, the amount of uh, training that I do. Um, it's always a trade-off between like the performance of your model and how fast you can train it. So depending, uh, uh, but of course a deeper model always works. Choosing the optimum number of layers, it's a bit of an art, so you're gonna have to try what works. Generally, the models that people have made are already very, very, um, very, very good and you really don't need to change anything extra um, to, to, make it, uh, to make it much stronger. What should be important is what we're gonna discuss next, uh, which is um, uh, how, how, to get, how to get more data uh, to train your model to make it more resilient. Um, 
so really, as of right now, in any transfer learning situation, I wouldn't change the model too much, except for maybe the output layer, uh, because the, the, the models are designed in such a way that you should not have to um, change those too much. Um, so really, uh, yeah, I, I would just change maybe just the output layer um, and not change too much of the internal layers. Um, on the model that's zero grad, so what happens is when you're training with PyTorch, you, uh, you have gradients uh, which are calculated at every back propagation step. Um, the, the way um, PyTorch works is it's this out, uh, auto gradient uh, thing. It's like a tape gradient. So think of it as like playing a cassette tape and you played it all the way until the end. And um, when you do one, one forward pass, it's like you play, you play like a bit of the, uh, of the tape up to a point. Um, and if you don't zero out the gradients, what happens is all the, all the computations that you've done up to that point gets added on and added on. So imagine I did um, a, a forward pass on uh, batch number one and got it some gradients and propagated back through those gradients and I forget to zero my gradients. What happens is in the next step, I would get the gradients of batch one and batch two together and I'm propagating the, the, the gradients of those together. So it's good and bad. Sometimes you want to accumulate gradients uh, for maybe like a really large batch training to get like a, uh, like a global thing, uh, like a global batch descent thing. But generally what we've seen is it doesn't work well um, um, unless you have a ton of memory because, uh, because those, those those gradients take up memory space and you need to somehow accommodate for all that. Um, Google has a paper out, I can't remember what it's called. Um, maybe I can put it up uh, if, uh, if I remember. Um, but basically it compares, uh, it, it tells you how to kind of get faster gradient descent and it's by increasing the batch size. Um, and one, someone commented, well, rather than increasing the batch size, you can just keep the gradients uh, over, over time, but uh, it's still, uh, again, it's a memory issue. So um, just going back to the whole zero grad thing, always zero your grad at every batch. Otherwise, you get your batch gradients accumulated and your back propagation is just going to always um, back propagate to batch one and batch two and batch three and so on as you go along. And um, that's the wrong way to batch because you always keep the information of past um, uh, of past batches and you just learn from like small, small batches more than you learn from other batches. So um, yeah, that, that addresses that, uh, the whole zero grad thing. Yep. Let's get back to our training, see how it's going. Oh, okay, so it's made it past um, 10 epochs and you can see our uh, accuracy is kind of like jumping up and down. Um, so it's at 34, 42, 34, 61. Okay, so we got, we pushed a bit uh, past 61, 60%, but then you can see the loss uh, started going back up. So 2.49, 3.0, 3.78, 3.58. 4, so at this point, we've, we're kind of over, uh, overfitting a bit, um, and this is uh, dangerous territory. So um, what can we do? Um, one thing that I like to do is have some weight decay on my optimizer. So uh, putting a weight decay, um, it forces your optimizer to kind of regularize, uh, to kind of like uh, put, uh, put like, a, uh, like a break on your weight so that it doesn't, uh, it's, it's not the same as gradient clipping, but it, it forces the weights to kind of like decay out over time. Rather than um, um, rather than stay the same weights over the entire training um, training uh, episodes, so I put some strong weight decay as as a form of regularization. So maybe like 0 0.001, but I think uh, a better idea is to get more data. So to address um, one of the questions from uh, from Abdullah, so one of the things that um, that I would do to kind of get my model to be better is to get more data. 
But like I've said, we, we only have 30 images of birds uh, per class, so we, we can't do much. But actually, we can. We can do data augmentation. So let's talk a bit about data augmentation. Let's keep this uh, here for now. Uh, data augmentation is, the idea of data augmentation is we want to kind of generate artificial data from our data set. So when you look at a bird, if you look at it tilted sideways uh, at like maybe 20 degrees, it still looks like a bird, right? Um, similarly, that same bird would look the same if it was kind of like flipped horizontally. It's as if you were looking at it from another side of a tree. So if you're looking at the bird from this side and then you looked at the bird from the other side, it's still the same bird, it's just flipped. So we can do horizontal flipping of images to get more, uh, to get more data. Uh, another thing that I would do is um, maybe rotate the images, shrink it, and enlarge it. So because you know these images are, um, uh, you can view a bird from far away and still notice that it's a bird, um, and view it very close and still notice that it's a bird. So uh, for for those reasons, we we can kind of do all these augmentation. And luckily, Torch Vision allows us to do this augmentation on the fly. And it allows us to, um, uh, to not only do this on the fly, but to do this without even touching our data set um, uh, manually by hand. So we don't have to do the rotations by hand. We don't have to um, you know, do any nasty tricks. We just add a transform that allows it to be random. And it will just generate random images for you. So let's have a look at that. So, and my transform, after I resize the image down to 224 by 224, I'm going to do transforms.horizontal flip, uh, random horizontal flip. Uh, so, um, yep, and then, so there's a bunch of transforms that you can do that's listed um, here. So there's random order, random perspective, resize prop, rotation. So I'm going to add rotation. So a rotation that gives you degrees, but, um, uh, I, I tend to give it um, some, some value between um, zero, uh, 0 and 0 0.2. So 0 0.2 out of 360 degrees, basically. I don't want it to rotate too much. Well, maybe we can rotate a bit more. Who cares? Um, and the other thing that we can do is um, to do random, let's see. Rotation, vertical flip. We don't want to flip it vertical because then it becomes upside down. Uh, but maybe we could do some affine transform. Hmm. We can do some affine transforms. Uh, I don't like affine transforms because they kind of shift the image too much sometimes. Because we've already cropped these birds into like a nice box, affine transformations would usually like move the birds out of the view, and that's usually bad for us. So for now, I'm just going to keep it as random horizontal flip and random rotation. We can probably play with the brightness and stuff, but um, um, may maybe we can do that. Actually, yeah, let's do that. We'll do color jitter. So color jitter, it plays with like the hue, saturation, and uh, brightness. So brightness, I'm going to say between, uh, yeah, let's do zero, 0 to 0 0.2. Contrast, about the same maybe, and saturation. Uh, maybe not as much because then you'll you're changing the color uh, point one okay so now that we have all these transforms let's have a look at what our image would look like if uh, after all these transformations so um, let's just do a quick um, save image uh, make grid so I'm gonna make a grid from the images that I'm gonna load so images equals next Iter train set, um, train loader, sorry. And I'm going to make grid on images, save image, and always have normalize equals true here. So at this point, you want to normalize back your image because we've done all these weird normalizations and transformations that it's going to look weird if you, don't, uh, uh, if you don't normalize it back to the original colors. So just do that. Um, and I'm going to save it as batch.png. And I'm going to open it with image.open um, batch.png. Cool. Did I 
I lose connection or something? I think I might have, oh, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good. Uh, okay, wow, okay, these images are bigger than I thought. Um, did we, is there some rotation applied? I feel like nothing happened. Well, uh, let's do this. I'm gonna resize to uh, uh, 128 by 128 or 256. Uh, 400 by 400. This image is just massive. Right. Um, so I don't think. So I think there's like slight rotations, but you know you can't tell because. Um, unless we uh, unless we set this rotation to like some massive number, so let's say one, and we try it again. You're gonna see like images kind of like sway way out, you know, like. Um, no, actually. Oh, maybe. Ah, but this is in degrees, right? Oops. I believe this is in degrees. I believe this is in degrees, or is it in, let me, uh, oh yeah, it is in degrees. Um, uh, okay, let's, let's go with 30 degrees. I don't wanna go beyond that. I was wondering why it doesn't rotate that much. There we go. That might be overkill. But you know what? I'm fine. I'm fine with it. Still looks like a bird to you guys, right? <laughs> um, even though it's like being turned like crazy. Okay, maybe we'll turn it down. Maybe we'll go with 15 degrees. Whatever. The, the, the point here is this is how you would um, create like a image augmentation pipeline in PyTorch um, just to make your training um, a, a lot more effective. So once we're here, um, let's reset our AlexNet and let's reset our criterion and optimizer. And at this point, you can kind of like play with your, um, uh, with your settings here. So I'm going to set 20 epochs here. I'm um, going to remove the inner TQDM, the inner progress bar because I think it's relatively fast. So. So now it should be training on the augmented images. Uh, yeah. So I set my batch size to 64. Feel free to set to whatever batch size you like. Uh, 64 seems to work relatively fast. Um, uh, 128, you start getting diminishing returns because um, these images are relatively big and it takes time to kind of push it out into GPU. Um, so there you go. Um, any questions? Can you elaborate more? Okay, um, are there any best practices on choosing what transformations to use? Um, best practices, um, not really. To really just go crazy with uh, transformation, as long as you can reason that the transformation that you use produces images that are like the, the data set that you will uh, validate on or, or test on. So if you're, you know, if you change your image so much that, you know, a cat that is orange looks purple, and like, you know, um, a, a carrot looks blue or something, and you test it on carrots that look orange, then it doesn't really make sense, right? So, um, so go crazy with the with the augmentation because, like, even small value changes inside um, the training images will give you, um, you know, will 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 be different data that the the neural net will see. Um, but you, uh, you you have to keep it conservative enough such that your training uh, your test set is still in the in the super set, in the subset of your and uh, uh, your data augmentation. Um, yeah, the uh, the other thing is in um, in let's see uh, what what was it called uh, in the ImageNet paper. 
Um, the way they trained it was they had this uh, principal components analysis that they do on pixels. Um, that changes the brightness in such a way that you never really um, uh, violate any like you know uh, any weirdness you know like um, so it doesn't turn a chair to you know from from wooden color to like purple or anything so it maintains this thing but it it still maximizes the variability of the of the um, pixels that you can have which is kind of the idea of a data augmentation is to have this variance and because PCA maximizes the variance of the uh, pixels that you can have it allows for like a really safe um, pixel uh, uh, data augmentation uh, pipeline, uh, but it's again a bit of a dark art to 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 do when um, uh, when when thinking about data augmentation to that extent. But uh, there there are some works which uh, which talk about data augmentation effectively um, uh, as as we do it. So um, let's get back to training here. So oh okay. That was a short training epoch before we jump back up. Um, actually, did I have, aha, uh -huh, okay. So what I had was my training transformation is this random rotation, but my testing transformation is also rotating the images and um, I don't want that to happen because I'm gonna train on static images. Um, and that's how I, uh, I, I want to test on static images. I don't want to uh, test on wobbly images. So I'm going to have two transformations where um, I'm going to have a train transform and a validation transform. And the validation transform is just going to be um, the same but minus this random stuff. Yes. And I'll just pass in the train transform here and the validation transform here. Oops. There you go. Uh, can this guy move away? Um, okay, so now I have a valid transformation and a train transformation. I'm gonna restart the training. Uh, I'm gonna set my data loader. Get my CNN and uh, criterion optimizer and train. Yeah. So anyway, we we've gotten this far. We we know now how to kind of take features of the neural net, um, convert it into features that we can use for machine learning and use it for machine learning. Or we can just actually tra retrain parts of the convolutional neural net um, to kind of fine tune the weights and you know and get um, you know get really good uh, well get higher accuracy with data augmentation and so on and so forth by fine tuning the CNN uh, the the classifier layers of the CNN. Um, uh, I guess I would show you, I, do I have results for this? Maybe not. Um, let's see. No, maybe not. Maybe I, yeah, again, these notebooks, um, we're not going to give you this one today. We're going to give you a pre-prepared one with comments and um, uh, more and more explanation on uh, what the code does and everything. So um, uh, that will be accessible to you um, uh, after the talk. Um, but for now, um, let's just let this train and um, you should be able to, as we've seen before, uh, before we did the whole data augmentation thing, we got to about 61%, which is slightly higher than 60% than we got before, uh, but it's not a much of an improvement. Um, and there is a reason why, and let's get back to the slides to understand why. So we, we are, we are retraining the classifier, we kept it small, we kept it well regularized, right? Let's take it one step further. Um, we have a lot of fine features in our data set. So they're not like, you know, fine, like, you know, sexy or anything, but they're like features that the original CNN has not learned well. So think about this example. So I have three birds, which 
are of different labels in the data set. So one is a common warbler. One is a, a yellow-breasted chat, I think. The other one is a common yellow throat. So which one do you think is which? Um, it's probably a hard question to kind of ponder because the, they, they look very similar in, this, in the sense that they have this yellow color. Um, but there are very fine features. For example, this dark circle around the eyes, darker back, or you know, like this fully yellow body um, head uh, included. So these are fine features that the original CNN, the CNN trained on ImageNet, might not have caught before, just because it was not trained on the specific features. You know, it's learned to generalize features to birds and planes and cars and ships and things like that, but to very specific features of birds, probably not. So we need to find a way to kind of label these guys properly by exploiting these features. But really, we, when we freeze the neural net, these features are already learned. So here's, what can we do, really? We can train the classifier, like, great, fine. Uh, can we train the CNN part, is what we, we're asking here. So we have a big CNN. We want to train the CNN part. Can we fine tune the CNN? Well, maybe in a small neural, uh, in, in a smaller, well, not really small, but in a less deep model like AlexNet or something, that might be possible. But when you use a ResNet, it becomes too expensive. And one thing that we keep forgetting is we have too little data. Even after data augmentation, the number of parameters in deep networks will overpower the number of data that we have for, uh, for our case. So we're at an impasse here. Um, unless we can do something else, what about just training the tip of the neural network, the tip of the convolution, right? So we don't have to tune the entire neural net, but we can maybe fine tune just one of the convolution layers, specifically the one towards the end. Why is this important? Because towards the end, we have these very complex features that come out to play, right? So in, in, uh, in the images of foxes, for example, you, you, in uh, the deeper layer of, um, this is, I think, Google Net, you, you have these sort of fox-like images appearing. But even deeper, you would get like the fine features appearing out. So you know all the you know black contours and things like that. So in the images of gibbons, I think these are gibbons. You you have a layer that encodes for gibbons and supposedly some flowers as well. But you know, forgive the flowers. There are images that you know that looks like gibbons and features of gibbons and things like that. So what what we want to do is maybe if we can fine tune these deeper convolutions, we, we can kind of accelerate the learning such that we can also get these fine features learned and improve the classifier of our, um, um, of our neural net while not having to train the entire thing from scratch, uh, which is really good, right? So why don't we do just that? We, we update uh, those weights and we, uh, you know, we can kind of get a better idea of uh, uh, get a better model entirely. So let's do just that. How is our training going? Yeah, it's flopping around. Um, probably my learning rate is too high. So I, in my code example, I think I use, ad, uh, I use SGD with Nesterov uh, as, as my optimizer. T seems to work better, um, quote unquote. Um, Adam, I think, is a bit too thrashy with all these things, but anyway, I'm going to stop Adam, um, and I'm going to see, I'm going to uh, show you how we can kind of fine tune some of the CNN layers. So stop, 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 stop. Okay, my notebook is not listening to me. Um, I'm going to terminate it. Uh, interrupt. There we go. Um, right. So with AlexNet, it looks like this. So maybe let's look at uh, another uh, another model that we can fine tune. Um, VGG16 is one that is commonly uh, cited as well. 
Um, so let's import that into our um, workspace. So VGU16 is a massive model. It's a lot bigger than AlexNet. Um, it's a lot deeper. Um, the 16 uh, is, a, is a representation of how deep it is. Let's have a look at VGG16 in um, before we do any of this freezing and stuff. So VGG16 looks like this. So if you remember, AlexNet was about 200 megabytes or so to, um, uh, uh, of weight information. VG16 is 500 megabit, uh, megabytes. So it's half a gig of weights, so of uh, vectors, uh, of uh, kernel features and stuff. So um, yeah, so it's very deep. So there's basically 16 layers of convolutions um, spread out, but uh, they keep the kernel sizes very, very, um, very, very regular. So it's always a three by three kernel. Um, uh, uh, in comparison to AlexNet, which starts with like seven by seven or something, or eleven by eleven or something. Um, so that that's why it's very, very deep. Um, and we have uh, a really big output layer with like linear two five zero eight eight and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, replace my classifier altogether. I don't think it's going to need three layers of. Uh, uh, it, it's not going to need three hidden layers for the classifier. And I'm just going to fine tune the last uh, convolution layer. So to do that, first I will freeze all the CNN uh, parameters and just leave the last one uh, to be trainable. And then I'm going to remove the classifier, make a new one for myself. So first, I'm going to freeze all the parameters of the uh, convolution, uh, of the CNN part. So for params in, okay, param in um, cnn.features.parameters, parameters. Um, I'm going to do param dot requires grad equals false. So frozen uh, for param in CNN dot features. What was the last convolution that I want to tune? 29. Nope, 28. This guy, conf2d. So um, because we can index this as a list, so we can do, we can do just that, parameters. Param dot requires grad equals true. Awesome. And then I want to remove the classifier altogether, create my own one. Uh, to do that, we just do CNN dot classifier. I just define a new sequential thing, which is so we have to keep the same number of linear output, which is 25088. But I'm just, I'm just going to have two layers. So 25088 down to 1024. And uh, sorry. Sorry, sequential is, um, is just, a, uh, it's just a component. Uh, I'm going to have a linear, which is 25088 two, by 1024. And I'm going to have a ReLU. Re, re, um, do I want dropout? Okay, I'll have dropout. I'll drop out 0.5. Um, and I'll have another linear for the output. So 1024 by 200. That's it. That's my smaller sequential unit compared to theirs, which is 25088 and then ReLU dropout. Linear again, ReLU dropout. So I'm just going to have something very, very shallow, uh, ReLU before dropout. Now. And that's it. So if I have a look at my new CNN now, we can see that the classifier component has been changed into mine, um, my classifier component. And then we'll have to train this classifier component from scratch, but we're, we're fine tuning the convolution at layer 28 of the, uh, of the convolution features, right? So. Um, I'm gonna still set with that. Okay, well let's let's change the optimizer. Let's let's get uh, let's get crazy a bit. We're gonna do SGD. We're gonna keep the weight decay very small, and we're gonna have Nesterov momentum enabled. Nesterov equals true, 
and I'm gonna also use um, my learning rate, yeah. My learning rate is gonna be, let's start with something small, 0 0.001. Um, because um, the, the, the net is quite big, and I imagine, well, actually, yeah, maybe we, could, maybe we can go 0 0.03, because we want this to run quite fast too. And once all that is set, I have an error. Oh yeah, I need I need to pass in a momentum parameter. Momentum uh, zero point nine. That's kind of like a standard value everyone always uses. So let's keep it that way. Cool. Um, and once I'm done, we can train. So um, let's get back to questions while we train. Nope, I've already answered all those so far. Mm. Yeah, it's taking a while to train, but um, definitely because it's a batchable process, you can you can make this. You can kind of pause the training and like you know go to bed, continue training the next day or something. Um, resume the checkpoints and is that me? That was me, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Twenty. But I have uh, I have a separate notebook that does up to a hundred. Um, uh, I'll show you the results in a bit. Actually, you know what? Let's 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 have a look at the the, the results for there. Um, um, so, like I said, I did some practice a few days ago. Uh, no, 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 no. Let's open a new tab. Colab first came out a few years ago. I think last year or two years ago. I started using it two years ago when, when it first came out. I think I got a tweet by one of the big guys in ML and they said like, hey, free GPU for use, Colab, you know? And I was like, hell yeah. Yeah, for, for the longest time I've been using Jupyter. Even in my current work now, we, um, it's a big part of my pipeline. Um, it's uh, not necessarily the best environment to work in, but um, I, I think I've been institutionalized by <laughs> the whole thing. So it, it, it's foreign if I see Python being in like a MATLAB sort of layout. You know, <laughs> like some people like Spider, which is like this MATLAB sort of layout. Yeah. So with the TP option. I don't know if PyTorch supports CPU yet. I think it does for the newer ones. I haven't had a chance to try it out yet. Uh, I don't know how easy it is. Maybe it's like just setting TPU. Um, in TensorFlow, they have um, they have tutorials for you to try out the TPU. Yeah. So uh, fortunately, I don't play with TensorFlow too much anymore. Um, so ah yes, let's address questions then. Is there an optimizer that works well with any kind of problem? Uh, or do you need to test and find out what works with, what works best with the problem you're working with? Um, yeah, so there's, there are rules of thumbs, really, when it comes to choosing your optimizer. Um, like, um, like when you're training recurrent neural networks, Adam is usually better than SGD because the, the gradients, you propagate gradients over a very long time space. And there's just so much gradients that SGD usually goes, um, like, uh, it, it usually explodes. Um, so Adam is usually better. Um, in terms of, uh, so there's always a trade off between Adam and SGD. Um, all, all things considered, like if you go with Ada Delta or Ada Grad, they're kind of like just improvements of SGD, but really SGD is like the king. Um, so the, the, the trade-off is that with SGD you get a very uh, you get a, um, you get a very nice fit like your model fits very well um, versus Adam um, Adam the, the fit is not as good but the gradient descent is quick um, so what what I tend to do is uh, go with Adam first whenever you're trying out a model see how good you can get and then go with SGD with maybe um, um, what is it called? Uh, 
learning rate scheduling, where you like decrease the learning rate over time, which is kind of simulating what Adam does because Adam has this adaptive learning le uh, learning rate changing over time. But the adaptive learning rate is kind of greedy, at least I think it is. Um, with SGD, you can kind of like choose at which point you want to decay the learning rate. And usually you would decay the learning rate when the training plateaus at, uh, at any point. Um, and usually with SGD, you get a lot better results um, if you do the scheduling right. Um, then it comes the question, what kind of scheduler do you use? Um, Multi-step scheduler is the one I used to use because uh, I usually use because it's um, you can control it very well. Others use there's like cyclic learning rates. Uh, there's learning rates which has cosine annealing and all these things. Uh, I think that's you know a bit of black magic. I think multi-step works well. It's been shown in many papers to work well. So um, stick stick with something simple. I think is always a good idea rather than going crazy with like uh, cyclic learning rates. Although people say cyclic lear learning rates seems to uh, converge faster, but um, uh, you can give it a try. PyTorch has cyclic learning rate scheduling, um, but learning rate scheduling can only be done with SGD, um, cyclic learning rate. Uh, you can decay learning rates manually with Adam. Sometimes it works okay, sometimes it doesn't work well, but Adam, since it has its own learning rate decay adaptively uh, um, ingrained inside the optimizer, you shouldn't use uh, learning rate decay with Adam anyway. So. Good question. Um, I believe there isn't, but Torch, uh, well, at least for PyTorch, there isn't. Maybe in TensorFlow, there is. If you go to the PyTorch website, um, um, so Torch Vision is kind of like the big one um, uh, in, in, uh, in the docs, uh, and it has so many uh, pre-trained models. Actually, I'll show you what kind of models it has. So there's Torch Vision, which is the vision component for Torch. And it has models like, uh, if I can find my models. Models, models, models. There we go. Um, so it's got AlexNet, VGG, ResNet, SqueezeNet, DenseNet. I'll zoom in a bit for you guys. Um, uh, Inception V3, ShuffleNet, MobileNet. It has video uh, as well somewhere, anyway. Um, that's probably not what you're asking. What you're asking about is Torch Audio. So as far as I know, it does not have any models for audio data set, but it does have some pre-processing uh, pre um, libraries for, for audio, like converting to spectrogram, uh, mel, spectral, sepstral, and all these things. I don't work with audio too much, but uh, I know these transforms exist. So you can kind of use this as a pipeline to train your models. Unfortunately, maybe because it's in like a very early phase, because Torch audio did not come out until like maybe version 1.3, which was like the last version before this one. Right now it's at 1.4. At 1.3, I think I started seeing Torch audio, so I think they're just training the models at the moment to be put up um, online. Um, so maybe keep your eyes peeled for this page. Maybe new models may be popping up very soon. Or maybe just put up a, an issue on GitHub. Um, I, I'm sure the PyTorch people will gladly help out with, um, uh, with anything there. If you still can't find anything, Googling helps a lot. I know a lot of people put up their PyTorch code on GitHub. Uh, so if you do like GitHub, um, maybe the name of a paper or the name of a network for audio, uh, audio classification or something, um, that, that could get you a long way already. Maybe there's, uh, and also include PyTorch in the, in the search keyword, then you will find GitHubs which have all of those together and uh, maybe start using their code um, and you know, uh, change things and, and such, so. Yeah, let's get back to my training screen which is here, uh, here. Uh, so we're at 69%, oh, okay, we, we crossed over 76%, 80% here. So we're, we're getting there, but our loss seems to increase. Oh, no, 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 it's decreasing. But it's starting to increase again here. So we're at 80%, so I guess we, we pushed 20% extra um, on top of our uh, previous model. So we can probably do early stopping and stop our training here, save the best model. Uh, and so on and so forth. 
Um, but it's at this point where you can say, okay, let's stop the training. Let's you know, um, uh, let's actually start you know doing classification, uh, doing testing and stuff. So at this point, I would say, okay, enough training. Um, please, enough training. <laughs> okay, I have to do the interrupt execution thing. Okay, so I would say enough training. Let's um, you know, let's actually look at uh, our testing set and do predictions for our testing set and evaluate on the testing set. So right now we've only done evaluation on our validation set, which is relatively small. So what we want to do is uh, pull out our test set and um, um, actually try it out. So with this model, it's doing pretty well, like 73%. Um, I, got, I got to around 70% during, uh, during, my, uh, during my tests. It jumped to 80%. I wish I would have saved this model at 80%. Um, should have done that. <laughs> um, save the state at 80% because I haven't gotten to 80% yet and uh, I've done some pretty crazy training. Um, so anyway, uh, that regardless, I'm gonna um, load up my, uh, the test set. So um, full disclosure, I haven't actually looked at the test set ever. This is the first time we're looking at the test set, so together. Um, and like a good you know, machine learning engineer, we don't look at the test set until it's time to test. Um, so this is what I'm doing today. Um, I believe the configurations of the model is the same as the one in the notebook that I trained on. Maybe I use AlexNet rather than VGG, but um, that's inconsequential. The, the, the methods are similar. Um, so I'm gonna, yes, have my test set on the valid transformation, that's fine. Um, let's see how good our test set is. Um, so I'm just gonna copy this section of the evaluation code. Um, so with, well, with PyTorch, you can stop training in the middle. Nothing, also, uh, of, 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 although it says keyboard interrupt and things um, erroring out everywhere, your models are being saved, uh, well, not being saved into file or anything, but it's being remembered and um, anything that's not learned uh, is just thrown away. So you don't have errors in your model um, when, when you're, when, if you stop it um, abruptly. So um, yes, we set it to evaluation mode and we load from our test loader, images to device, our loss is this. Um, actually, ah, I see, that's why we're getting 70%, uh, 80%. I'm only picking out the, the loss at only one particular instance. I should average out the loss. Uh, apologies for that. So let's make a list of losses, a uh, list of accuracies as well. Um, so at every inst, at every because we pr uh, we predict in batches, uh, and we tr uh, and yeah, that validation should be uh, in one big batch, uh, in one big um, uh, list as well. So losses dot append loss dot item, and then accuracy. Accuracies append accuracy dot item, and here we just do mean np dot mean losses and np dot mean accuracies. Boom. Right. So fingers crossed. Let's see how we do on the test set. Uh, I should have done uh, the progress bar, <laughs> but whatever, too late for that now. Any day now. Okay, there we go, 70%. Good, so it's just like the simulations, um, so I'm happy. So uh, ideally, if we got 80%, I would be even happier. If you guys can beat this score, get the notebook from, uh, from uh, the, uh, when we pass it on to you guys. 
try out your best model. You know, see, just try out any architecture that you think uh, you think is interesting. Try out different architectures. There's dense nets. There's um, uh, mobile nets. Anything that you think you you might be able to push above 70. At this point, uh, you, you know, in in the competition, you're you should be really proud of yourself. You should be really happy with this score. Um, pushing it a bit further. One trick that um, a lot of data scientists tell me in Kaggle is ensemble the model. So try, you know, VGG with AlexNet, with InceptionNet, with whatever, and then like average out the predictions and so on and so forth. I'll leave you guys to do that yourself. Um, but really, you 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 you've now gained the skills to uh, to uh, to transfer any model uh, from deep learning to machine learning. You've learned how to fine tune the models in terms of the classifier and in terms of the convolution filters themselves. And what's left is whatever you guys want to do. Train your own models, your image classification models, your image segmentation models, and so on. Um, uh, check the Torch Vision page for other models that are available. Careful with pre-processing. One thing that I faced, even in the Torch Vision packages, some of the segmentation models don't actually have ImageNet segment, uh, ImageNet preprocessing, so you don't have to preprocess before you pass into the models. Uh, so you know, PyTorch forums will help out if you have errors with accuracy or things not appearing correctly. Uh, what um, I I was interested to do, but don't have much time to, is to do GANs with these tr uh, transfer learning with GANs. So you have a pre-trained model that you can kind of like flip and reverse and to generate images and you can have a discriminator. I was thinking like with, uh, GANs is a big thing. Um, I, I don't think I'm ready to do GANs yet because it's a bit of a black magic. It's a dark art in of itself. But um, what I was interested in is if you had a pre-trained model and you do a GAN and can you regenerate the images that they were trained on sort of thing? Right, because these these guys were right, right, right. So um, that would be uh, that, that would be like a really interesting thing to uh, to look at. Ooh, that 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 would be pretty interesting. Yeah, like w were they actually fake or were they you know real? Right. So um, again, like research questions here um, um, that that comes up every time I do these things. Um, this just in, um, Kaggle has a new competition up. I think a few days ago uh, they posted this email to me. Categorize animals in the wild. Huh, that sounds familiar. Um, identify plant species from herbarian specimens. If they are images, hey, you know, you know what to do now. You have, you have, the, uh, you have the tools at, um, uh, at your hand. Do you regularly take Kaggle? Kaggle, not so much. Um, I feel like uh, I'm, uh, I'm like, uh, you know, under virus, not even under dog, you know? Like, I'm like a tiny guy in Calgary. <laughs> the grandmasters just know what they're doing, you know? And I think uh, there's, there's a different thinking that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, right, right. So. For sure, for sure. Yeah, 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 competitive uh, AI thing. Uh, I'm more of fun. <laughs> and learning sort of thing, but uh, feel free. I mean, if if you, if you think you can uh, match their scores, I I've I've usually whenever I try, I barely match like the you know the top one thousand or something, which is uh, pretty interesting. Like you 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 realize how how much you overfit data sets more 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 often than not. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, feel free to try it there, and um, that's it from me. Uh, find me at Chaffers. Find me on my website. We'll post uh, my website uh, to you guys as well. And I posted in chat already. But Perfect. But you can, uh, you can definitely look at all the data sets that you've shared as well as the previous workshop you did. Correct, so correct. On yeah, I'll upload all these slides uh, in, um, I guess, in parallel to uh, the assembly. And all the code uh, and everything will be available um, on my website too. So uh, keep your eyes peeled. We'll send out a notification uh, with all the with all the links and stuff. So I'll bring back Nikhil on the camera. So to well, close off, keep you there. Thank you so much, Sir No problem. That was you must be exhausted. Uh, <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> but, that's for sure. Well, we definitely do that. But that concludes like our first session going purely online. And uh, you know, I think I think 
Shafiq is a pre it's quite a natural here when it comes to this stuff. So thank you for that. I mean, that was a lot of stuff that I hadn't even delved into. I, I would love to do the gangs topic at some point because mm. that's something that everyone knows. But like you said, it's it's like you know, it's black magic. Yeah. People just <laughs> keep out, keep away from it until they know what they can do with right, it. Right. Right. So great. So yeah, I mean, this isn't going to be our last online session only. I mean, we've definitely set up in a nice way that uh, that we can definitely do that. Next week, we're going to be doing Arduino Day. So I know that might not be of particular interest to all data scientists, but uh, we're doing a lot of fun stuff with that. We'll have giveaways. We'll have stuff that, uh, you know, insights from the experts. So it's, it's a global celebration that was supposed to be a global live celebration, but I think a lot of people have switched over to online, including Arduino themselves. So that's going to be next. And of course, going forth for the foreseeable feature, future until we hear about Here's something different. We will be doing these. We try to do more online content as well, you know, during the week. We'll try to share more because I know people have, a, have uh, some people are housebound, some people are, uh, you know, definitely keen to get more info. So we'll definitely post more of that. If you have any comments, do share on there. Uh, do share on the social media as well. We posted the slide up there so you can find us on a number of different things. You can find us as Make Smart Things. And we are definitely going to be, uh, you know, posting more content, and we are going to interact more. We're not, you know, that's what we said. Learning doesn't stop, as well as like we don't want to just like shut down everything just because of the situation. But uh, we will definitely, uh, we will definitely be doing more stuff that going forth. So online is a great opportunity as well. Like we can share a lot of things, and you know, you can also follow in your own comfort wherever you are in the world. So. There are many bonuses, so I hope we can definitely do a bit more with this. So I think you can just uh, we can just switch back to the title thank side, you. and then we can just figure out that. So anyhow, just want to sign off. I want to thank Shafiq again. Oh. Shafiq's just off Thanks camera, but uh, but we'll definitely have more of him. Hopefully, once things sort of settle down, we'll get you back for a live workshop as well. And yeah, of course, I mean this is our third. Uh, data science workshop. We're going to keep doing these every once in a while. We want to get into this, uh, you know, want to go in for more advanced sessions that, you know, obviously experts can follow as well, not experts necessarily, but uh, maybe people who have some knowledge of machine learning and want to take it to the next level. So we definitely want to encourage you. So anyhow, just signing off now. So do check back and do leave us your comments and let us know what's there. Subscribe to the page. I, I've started saying that also, but you've already on our forum. We'll definitely be sharing all the links online. So. Um, the, que the stuff that came in the questions, we'll update the description and share for sure. whatever is there. So please do send in our questions. Thank you for, uh, for to everyone, and we'll see you next week.